Welcome back, my friends, to another episode of the BJJ Brick Podcast. Very special episode here. We're going to be talking about Masuhiku Kimura. That's right, Kimura, the guy the submission is named after. My name is Byron, and I've got an amazing story here today. We've got record-breaking accomplishments. Kimura was a phenomenal martial artist. We've got history-making matches. Uh, one of them you probably know about with Elio Gracie. We're going to talk about World War II and how that affected Kimura and what he did during that time. There are several knife fights. One of them, Kimura, gets stabbed. The story of Kimura would not be complete without telling you about the large madman that goes into a rage and attacks Kimura. We've got much, much more. I didn't even tell you yet about the urine-soaked blade that leads to an infection and death of one of the key characters in the Kimura story. My friends, we've got a lot to talk about. Let's get right to the show. When I started this journey about learning about Kimura and, and the submission and the, the person behind that name, I first knew basically what everybody in the jiu-jitsu world knows is that he submitted Helio Gracie with a Kimura. Or he broke his arm. This is what I, this is what I believed. And you could hop on YouTube and you can watch pieces of this video. And there's, there's one video. It's got well over a million views, almost two million views at this time. It's, it's about two and a half minutes long. It's on the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy uh, YouTube webpage. This video is narrated by Henner Gracie, and he's the son of Horian Gracie, and he's the son of Elio Gracie. So you see the, uh, that really we have a video of uh, a grandson talking about his grandfather. That's really cool. If, if, just imagine if Kimura's grandson uh, made a video about this and, and told that story. It, wouldn't that be a much more interesting than a guy like me telling this story? Or would it be a little less accurate? Don't know. A little bit more information about Henner Gracie. He is a co-creator of uh, Gracie University. It's one of the biggest online jiu-jitsu training programs. His father, Horian Gracie, was one of the founders of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, the UFC. And he's recognized as one of the most important people to bring uh, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to the United States. Horian doesn't really come up much in this podcast, but I just thought I would give you the bridge between Elio Gracie and Henner Gracie. Uh, that's his grandfather. I really only bring up Henner Gracie because of his YouTube video that explains the history between Kimura and and Elio Gracie, and what happened in that fight. And this is a really nice video. It's, it's short, unlike this podcast. It's compact, it's well-produced, and it's kind of fun to watch. You know, it's like a well, well-made documentary. It kind of churches or jazzes up the old footage and mixing in shots with Henner Gracie talking about the Academy, and, and it has different camera angles on him, and it's got a little bit of fight footage. It's got some still pictures, and, if you know, words popping up on the screen. They really do their best to make it... Uh, a little quick, interesting historical video of, in reality, what is just this old black and white fight footage. It's set to exciting music and has some cool B-roll footage of Brazil back in the day. Uh, Henner explains, but this video isn't just about the one match with Kimura. It's, uh, Henner also explains that Elio has a match with Keto. Keto was one of uh, Kimura's uh, traveling training partners where they would they'd travel around and, and do judo and, and basically try to make money. And I want to talk about this video that, that Henner's in, not because it's a, a simple way to, to bring you up to speed, but it just kind of helps explain why most of the people in jiu-jitsu believe certain things about Kimura, uh, the person, and, and Elio, and, and that match. Henner explains that the first fight is with Kato, not with Kimura. And, and there's a little bit of fight footage cutting in and out. Uh, it's in a boxing-style ring, and, and Kato and Helio uh, are, are fighting, and, and Kato throws Helio, and, and it ends with Helio choking Kato unconscious from his guard. They're kind of near the ropes of the ring, and that's that's the fight footage for that fight. It, it ends with somebody trying to wake up the unconscious Kato. Pretty clear how that fight went. 
Well, the pre-fight footage rolls for the next fight. So uh, you, you can picture yourself in Brazil, and and people are are you know getting ready for the fight and entering the arena, and and there's some you know footage of the of the fighters of of Kimura and Ilio kind of walking to the ring and getting ready. Hinner continues to narrate the story in this video, and there's a variety of interesting facts that Hinner narrates, and we're going to get to these facts in just a little bit. As you watch the video, the match starts. It's on a big open mat space. It's not a ring. The two competitors both wearing kimonos and black belts. Kimura looks to be heavier, but he's not as tall as Helio. The fighters approach each other and begin to engage. The video cuts to Hinner, also wearing a kimono and a black belt. Uh, and he continues to explain the history of this match. For now, I will just get into describing the match. I'm not going to get really into what Hinner is saying and narrating. The video shows a throw uh, by Kimura, and then Kimura working in a top position. There's several cutaways, you know, when the action kind of changes, and you don't know if you know they're doing it to keep the action kind of lively or whatever. But there's some editing of the actual fight. Snapshot to side control, then to north south. Uh, it looks like there's some rolling, possibly uh, someone, you know, Kimura trying to get it back. A control position by rolling for it and then Hinder jumps in and says round two so here we go uh, more of just kind of visualizing the fight for you we see uh, Kimura trying to jump past the guard of Elio and the next shot is Kimura working uh, best described as a head scissors position and working on his Kimura attack of the shoulder the submission finish is not shown it cuts to a clip of Kimura standing and helping Elio up off the ground from uh, kind of a turtle position. After the fight's over, Hinder continues to explain the fight from his grandfather's point of view. And then the video cuts to an advertisement for a t-shirt for Gracie versus Kimura uh, in the GracieAcademy.com. That's how I first learned about this match. That's how I first learned about Kimura, that's how many people uh, have have watched this video and learned about this historic event. And this episode of the BJJ Brick Podcast isn't just about one fight. As I dug deeper into who Masahiko Kimura was, he got really interesting. And it's it's definitely worth telling his story. And this is a definitely a chapter in his story. But we get a lot more into it later on. I mentioned that that Henner's narrating and and talking about the the match and and we're gonna pull twelve facts that that have been said from the video. And I did my best to describe like the action in the match. It's really very limited footage, but what's said is very important as well. So here are the twelve things that I was kind of able to glean from the video that was said by Henner. Uh, Kimura was the best jiu-jitsu fighter ever. Uh, then he said, this seems a pretty basic fact, Kimura was going to be in Brazil. Uh, Kimura had Helio fight Kato, the number two jiu-jitsu fighter. Uh, Helio fought Kato and choked him after six minutes. We're at fact number five here. Uh, Kimura versus Helio would be the first time the jiu-jitsu championship would be held outside of Japan. Uh, also, Kimura was 80 pounds heavier. Uh, number seven, this is a, a quote that he's saying from Kimura. If Elio could last three minutes without giving up, he would be the winner. Uh, number eight, Kimura grabbed and ragdolled Elio. Uh, another one, Kimura attempted submissions, but Elio would defend. Number 10, uh, Carlos threw in the towel uh, due to the shoulder lock. Uh, number 11, an interesting fact, Elio never expected to beat Kimura. And then, and then the last thing I could kind of glean as a fact is more of a statement. Uh, Elio is the definition of a warrior, a fighter, modern-day samurai. So there's 12 facts that you can get from the video. We're going to come back to these facts later. I just want you to know up front, many of these facts are not true. And one of them that sounds totally fake is actually true by all indications. And I was pretty surprised. So let's put that video and let's put that match on the side for a little bit here. And I just want to talk about the move, Kamora. If I want this, this podcast to be 
available for everyone. Uh, whether you're just trying to learn about this and you don't really even train yet, you know, I say yet because you'll start training and you're going to love it. Uh, or if you've got you know a ton of experience and you you already know about Kimura. So bear with me here as we're just going to talk about the move, the Kimura, a little bit, get everybody up on the same page. What is this submission? I'm going to do my best to avoid jargon. All the while, I know that most people listening to this are going to be training either jujitsu or judo, but I really want this to be for everyone to enjoy the story. It goes so much off the mats, and it's just such an interesting story. So let's take a step back and let's talk about the submission, the Kimura. You know, what is this? If you don't know what a Kimura is, uh, it is the sixth most common submission in the UFC. It's uh, in the top five submissions for both uh, gi jiu-jitsu and no gi uh, grappling submission wrestling. It's a submission done uh, at the elite levels still. You know, obviously in the UFC, if they're doing it, those are some of the best uh, athletes as far as uh, martial arts go and, you know, elite levels of competitive grappling. It's also a top five submission for white belts. And clearly you could do a Kimura in judo as well. The Kimura is a value submission in many different martial arts and at all skill levels. In the martial arts, we have a degree of freedom to pursue our own interests and go on a, a path of discovery. Many paths end in a dead end, and they really don't get you very far. You might have a move that does really good as a white belt or a blue belt when you're first starting out, and later on, it's just not a technique that you could uh, utilize against your more advanced uh, training partners or opponents. The Kimura is not one of those moves. If you learn a Kimura as a white belt, you may not be able to execute it against upper belts, but in the future, when you're up there with them, uh, the Kimura will be there with you. So it is always a good use of time to be studying and improving your Kimura. It will travel with you as you go uh, up the ladder in in uh, skilled opponents, or if you even change sports, you could go from amateur MMA to pro MMA, and you know your Kimura is there. You can go from MMA to jiu-jitsu. Your Kimura will be there. You go jiu-jitsu to MMA or judo. Uh, it's always going to pay dividends to have good Kimura skills. So to recap, is it a popular submission? Absolutely. It's a top 10 submission in MMA and gi, uh, jiu-jitsu, and no gi as well. And I guess I'd, if I'm bringing this up to no, no jargon, gi versus no gi, jiu-jitsu, gi, jiu-jitsu would be wearing the kimonos, and no gi is, is more of a uh, either a, a rash guard top and shorts or some – you know, some professionals grapple without a shirt and just shorts and grabbing the clothing and no gi is not allowed, kind of like in MMA. I did all that and I explained uh, how popular the Kimura is, but I really haven't explained what it is. Uh, the Kimura is used both as a submission and a position of control sometimes. And the Kimura can be applied from a wide variety of grappling situations, the most common being from the top dominant position, like side control, kind of similar to what we saw Kimura uh, implementing it on Elio. And from the side control attack, it typically will end in a north-south position. Another common uh, place to lock up a Kimura is from the guard, so from the bottom player. At this point, I've debated whether explaining what a Kimura looks like if you're not familiar with it and this is a podcast, my friends. It really is difficult to explain a Kimura, which has an it's an arm entanglement uh, to some degree. So pause this podcast if you're at a place where you can and go watch a few Kimura videos on YouTube. Just type BGJ or MMA and Kimura. They'll pop right up. There'll be a plethora to choose from. And that way you could wrap your head around what's going on in this match, if you're unfamiliar, I would imagine most people that are listening to this are familiar with what the Kimura is. The Kimura is a great move, very versatile. There's there's a ton of different positions you could lock this up in. You could learn the Kimura on your first day of training. You walk into the uh, to the gym and you could learn the Kimura, and you could also win a world championship with this technique. It just shows you that there's a lot of details to it that the world-class athlete is doing that the that the very beginner may be missing, but still they can get the results of the Kimura. The actual result of the Kimura is often felt in the shoulder. The most common injury to the Kimura is in the elbow. According to John Danaher, he's got a video 
on YouTube about the perfect Kimura. It's interesting. You should check it out. So there's kind of a variety of things that uh, something will fail. Your shoulder, the elbow, humerus. It, it's just kind of twisting it. it but m- if you had to ask the average person, it's a shoulder attack. And it's just maybe not the shoulder that fails uh, first <laughs> in most people. But that's where I feel a Kimura. I feel that I kind of have tight shoulders, and I will tend to tap to Kimuras a little bit early because of that. Now, let's look at the move, uh, kind of the basics of this Kimura move here. It it looks like it's two arms versus one arm, and that's why it's going to be good. That's not even the case. The Kimura is controlled by two arms, but the finishing motion is the twisting of your core. This is much stronger than two arms versus one arm. It's really upper body against that one arm. Uh, let's talk about the grip just real quick. Most jujitsu instructors uh, talk about not using your thumb for the grip, using kind of a hook hand or a monkey style grip where you keep your thumb uh, near your palm instead of using that opposable thumb that we have. And, and, and the advocation of this is that the grip is better for a pulling motion. Some instructors prefer to use the thumb and then change to the monkey grip at a certain time in the submission. If you think of the Kimura, it is kind of a, it's definitely more of a pulling motion than it is a pushing motion. That would give you the stronger grip with your thumbs not wrapped. This does seem like a weird thing. Why would I grab somebody's wrist and then also grab my wrist and not use my thumbs? And that's just it. Grappling is not intuitive. That is why you can't just put a strong, unskilled person on the mat and expect them to do well by making up what they're doing. Our instincts often fail on the mats when we don't know what we're doing. So uh, if your mind's telling you, well, of course the grip would be better if I had my thumb, it's just not the case, and it's just not intuitive as well. But that's a lot of grappling. That's why you have a coach. That's why you have teammates that help you get better. Now, a little fun fact here. In the fight with Helio, it does not show the actual finish of the technique or even the grip that Kimura that, that classic Kimura grip where you're grabbing their wrist and then grabbing your own wrist with your other hand. So I was like, well, we don't know for sure what he did with his thumbs. But I did find some footage of Kimura teaching this famous submission that he did. And in the instruction, he was using his thumbs. And I'll put a link to this video and, and any other thing I talk about, the videos... Uh, in the show notes, of course, so you can go check that out. And I'm not saying Kimura did it wrong. I just think it's it's maybe changed a little bit as we added even more science to it. And and Kimura, as you will learn about him as a person, was always willing to to grow and get better and and just adapt his style. So um, you know, back then in the in the in the time frame that he had, he had the best Kimura, I would say. But it's not that it hasn't changed since then. Not that there's not a better way to do that. So it's just it, I first saw that video like well it doesn't show the it doesn't show the footage of the of the fight finish so that's kind of disappointing I don't know if he uses thumbs or not but it's pretty clear when he's teaching it his thumbs are wrapped around and uh, that's kind of an interesting fun fact so if your coach is yelling at you that you're doing it wrong you know you probably should just change what you're doing <laughs> but you could also say I'm doing it Kimura style like uh, Masahiko Kimura. <laughs> But do it the correct way. It's, and it's also safer for your thumbs. They'll be less likely to get damaged if the opponent tries to rip their arm out. They won't go through your thumb. Uh, continue talking about the actual Kimura. Anytime you're doing an attack, the person uh, will have to deal with that in some manner. And for the Kimura, there's oftentimes people will grab their lapel, their belt, their pants, something like that. And really, they're just trying to get trying to kind of glue their hand in front of their body because the, the submission ends with their hand behind their body. And uh, if I can just keep it in front, I'll, I'll stay safe just for even a little while. So, you know, if, if they grab their lapel, um, it's really not a solution. It's, it's still the, the one arm versus the two arms and the core strength. And really it's one arm, but it's really it's just that, the hand strength of that arm. And eventually that's going to fail. And when it fails, it could be kind of in a fast jerking motion. You know, it doesn't need to be a steady pressure, which it sometimes can be as well. But the person might rip it out of there. And that makes the submission kind of end kind of quickly as well. A little bit more dangerous for people. 
Uh, you might think grabbing the belt, that's a good idea. Uh, no, grabbing the belt is not a good way to defend the Kamor because uh, the belt can be rotated. So you're grabbing onto a movable object. You could still hold the belt in front of your body and it could be rotated to behind your body with ever, never really addressing your grip. It's kind of funny to watch people grab their belt and then watch how that's dealt with. You know, they'll, they'll grab their, their pants or the inside of their leg in a nogi situation, and there's all ways to, to deal with these. It's a really dominant position, and the person really needs to, to work on getting out of this versus just delaying the submission. Like many positions and attacks in jujitsu, the Kimura is so strong that the attack is best dealt with by recognizing that the attack is starting and preventing the setup from being completed. So I grab that first wrist, and you're like, oh, he's going to do a Kimura, and you're able to prevent my second arm from coming in to lock up that, that grip. The Kimura is known to be a, a little bit more of a dangerous submission, especially in competitions, and it is because of that grabbing of the cloth and then the the ripping motion to get that grip to fail, and, and I'm putting, you know, potentially... You know, hundreds of pounds of pressure to get that grip to fail. And when it fails, the pressure is still there. And so your shoulder is tweaked more than you or I want it to be. And, and the tap really can't come quick enough. And even if the tap comes in, you know, quick, there's still a lot of momentum that I had to use to get that grip to break. Uh, so that's, that's really a big reason why the Kimura is a little bit uh, more of a dangerous submission for people to, to do because it's, it's got a high injury rate. Another side note here, uh, the Kimura position, so just that grip, uh, can be used uh, as a back take. It's, it's a great back take grip. And I talked briefly about the Americana. It's the same style of I grab where your watch would be, and then I grab underneath your arm and grab where my watch would be uh, with my other hand. But they're quite opposite. The Kimura is with your hand pointing in the down position, and the Americana is your hands up. like Kind of like you're waving at somebody. That'd be Americana style of attack on the arm. So in results, they're vastly different, and the Kimura is by far the more uh, utilized of the two submissions. We'll put that discussion of what a Kimura is away here. And if you if you want to learn more, or if I bored you, I'm sorry, you know all about Kimuras, but I want to get everybody on the same page because if we're talking about the submission, and if you don't know what the submission is, it probably wouldn't hurt you to uh, pause this and go watch a couple of videos of what a Kimura is or how to do a Kimura, and, and that will kind of bring you up to the same uh, page. It's kind of difficult to describe this in the audio setting, and I do plan on making a video about this the story as well. The next up here, I want to talk about the history of Kimura, the person, and then I'll talk a little about Helio's history and a little bit about him, and then we're going to have them have a match. Masahiko Kimura was born September 10th, 1917, and he died April 18th, 1993. Uh, his best competitive weight was was said to be uh, 187 pounds, and he was five foot seven. Kamora wrote a piece called "My Judo," and and I get a lot of the earlier information from that, and I get uh, a lot of other information from uh, there's a there's a book or two on Kamora. I'll put references to everything in the show notes, of course, if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper. But Kamora, he grew up kind of poor. Uh, at the age of 10, he would help his father gather uh, river gravel and stones to sell. They were literally selling rocks that they would get out of a river. On Sundays, he would haul the gravel, starting at like 4 in the morning, all the way to 6 in the evening. Uphill, right? It, but really, it probably was uphill, because if you're ha hauling gravel from a river, is a river typically high or low? You know, so you have to get it out of the valley that the river would be in, and uh, and sell that that gravel. It sounds like back-breaking work for people who didn't have a lot of other ways to make money. But this did help him build a strong body, even as a kid. Also, around the age of ten, uh, Kamora had kind of an interesting moment in school. He was joking around, causing the disruption in class, uh, having a good time. His teacher kind of slapped him around a little bit and he threw him several times 
and Kimura learned that the teacher was a first Dan in Judo. And so Kimura had made it his mission to become a second Dan in Judo, and that way he can get some uh, of that revenge. So that's when Kimura started training Judo. Uh, Kimura competed after about a year of training. He lost the match to a neighboring uh, school kid. He got pinned, and Kimura began training at school and at a dojo separate from his school. So he kind of doubled his training and, and got different eyes on him and, and helped him out with that. Let me say it again. Kimura, he lost his first match in judo to a neighboring school kid. It just goes to show you that where you start with your uh, judo or your jiu-jitsu does not determine where you end up. So if your first matches or first year or, you know, the first belts that you have, they're kind of rough. That doesn't mean you're going to end up at a certain level. Kimura got beat by the neighbor kid. <laughs> and then also a note here, uh, it's important. He started training at two places. Early age, Kimura saw the value in hard work, and he wanted to get better at this. He dedicated himself. He's got uh, two sets of coaches giving him the, you know, instruction. He's got... Uh, lots of eyes helping him and lots of time on the mat. So really kicked it up uh, pretty early on. It wasn't until the age of about 15 that Kimura started to find success in tournaments. So the first five years, Kimura struggled with judo. Now, when did he start to excel? <laughs> Kimura became a fourth Dan rank in high school. This was very rare for a Japanese high school student to achieve the rank of fourth dan. It got him national attention. So even in high school, he was, you know, he, he was definitely turning some heads and they were saying, who's this guy? And then Kimura led his team to the first ever national championship. His team hadn't done well in the past and, and he led them there. He beat three of the, the top opponents from a different school. And, you know, what that school was known for was Nuasa. That's... That's the groundwork. That's the, the part in judo. So typically you think of judo as, as a throwing art, but there's also work on the ground. You could also do submissions and you could pin the person. Uh, beautiful throws in judo, but there's nuaza is the groundwork. And Kimura, <laughs> he did well against these guys. He threw the first one and he beat the other two with nuaza. He beat them at their own game. He got one of them in a standing Kimura or what was called then as a Yudi Garami. Yudi meaning arm, and then Garami meaning entanglement. And then Kimura claimed that he was the first judoka, uh, like a judo competitor or player, to to land a Yudi Garami in competition. I don't know how true that was, but he he had he laid that claim that it hadn't been done before. So that's, that's a little bit of Kimura growing up and doing judo and coming up to the ranks there. Uh, Kimura gets attacked. So he's a school, a school kid, Kimura, here. And, and, and one of the other kids finds Kimura and says, and this is in Kimura's uh, kind of biography here called My Judo, I have a little business with you, so come with me. And Kimura, he knew those were fighting words. <laughs> it, it's just kind of funny. And so he followed the kid. And then the kid pulled a jackknife on Kimura. Kimura moved and evaded the blade, but eventually the kid caught him on the buttocks. Then the kid that just stabbed Kimura hopped on his bike and escaped. And if you think about it, the kid said, hey, you know, come with me. And he probably lured him closer to his bike so he could escape if he needed to. Uh, Kimura ran after this kid and while bleeding from his, his backside... Uh, got to the kid's house and the kid refused to come outside. The parents were telling Kimura that actually the the, the knife cut the kid's hand pretty bad. And uh, and that's kind of ended that fight there. Turns out that, yeah, the hand injury was worse than Kimura's uh, upper leg injury. Uh, but Kimura would miss about 20 days of training uh, judo from this knife wound. Just looking at this fight real quick here. Uh, the kid pulled a jackknife on Kimura. That's an important factor when you determine how this fight kind of unfolded. If you think of a semi-truck jackknifing on the highway, it's a terrible thing, but it folds. 
or like there's a there's a deck jackknife uh, dive you know for for divers off a diving board it's 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 a folding motion so a jackknife is a knife that opens and closes and so the kid went to cut kamora and then the knife likely folded on the guy's hand ripping it up or cutting it pretty badly so if it was a a different type of blade it could have been a lot worse for kamora cuz he did take damage in that one I also have a a kid's tip for you. Uh, Any kids out there listening? If somebody says, I have a little business to you, so come with me. Unless you actually have business like a lemonade stand or buying lemons, selling lemons, or refining sugar. Or maybe this kid is in the freezing water to make ice business. Don't go with that kid. (laughs) He's there going to be a fight. It's just far better to not fight the kid who says, I have a little business with you. That wasn't the only fight that Kamora got into. Kamora was also attacked another time by a knife while he was a kid. And it it was by a, a kid that Kamora refers to as K. And K was known to be the number one street fighter in his school. I don't know how you guys rank your street fighters at your school, but <laughs> it just seems like an interesting concept is he's the best street fighter. It, now, also, K was known to pull a, a knife in every street fight. And if K lost the fight, his family would get revenge on the other kid. So it's just kind of a bad spot Kamora's in. And, and K found Kamora on the bridge and said, Hold it right there, come with me. And then they walked to the park. And then K pulled a short sword and thrusted it at Kimura. This time, Kimura was able to evade the blade, and he threw K hard. Uh, this throw got K to apologize, and also K is like, I'm done with you. And, and he did not send his family to attack Kimura. It's funny to me, reading about these two fights that sound terrifying. Both the fights, the attacker requested Kimura to come with him, and then Kimura obliged. <laughs> That's crazy. In both these fights, his judo helped him to survive. If 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 Kimura didn't have any other, and I'm sure he at this point had got past the idea of getting revenge on his teacher. He had been competing and he had found some success and, and he was getting up there. And, and, and I guess Kimura doesn't describe exactly when in his judo career these happened, but this had to be motivating. If if judo, I don't know if you could say it saved his life on these situations, it definitely saved him from, from a bad spot. And ultimately, you know, if you have enough knife fights, death is on the table on those. You know, like, it, it could have happened. If this if Kimura would have fought this kid 100 times, odds are some of the times somebody would die. And, and judo prevented that from happening. But neither one of these is the urine-soaked blade that I alluded to earlier. So just know that there's another knife situation coming up with a nice blade soaked in that urine. So how hard was it for Kimura growing up uh, to be a kid in his shoes? Uh, he hauled rocks for money, was twice attacked by uh, by another kid with a knife. So looking back at my life as a kid... Uh, my manual labor was very limited. <laughs> I did some, but I definitely didn't haul rocks, you know, for entire days. And I was never attacked by somebody holding a knife. Who knows how many little tussles or fights he got into uh, that weren't mentioned by anybody. But it sounds like he was kind of in a rough spot. Uh, and, you, you know, he adapted and, and he made the best of it. Now, how good was Kimura at judo or at jujitsu? Well, I already mentioned that he was a bit of a prodigy by the time he got to high school. He was the youngest fifth dan in Japan. By the time it was late 1930s to early 1940s, Kimura was dominant in competitive judo. His, his training was a large part of that. He would train in other arts. He would train in judo, of course. He would do weights and cardio training. And a lot of competitors did not do these things. He was, he was kind of ahead on, on the game, especially with the weights and the cardio training. 
Now, Kimura did lose four matches. I'm not talking, not talking about the match as early stuff as a child. He lost four matches in 1935. These are really his only four losses in his competitive career. His first one was Osawa Kinchiro. Now, Osawa is much more experienced than him. And he reversed one of Kimura's throws, putting him on his head and knocking him unconscious. After that, Kimura was still shaken from the concussion. He had a match with Abe Kinshiro, and Abe was smaller and very elusive. Kimura said it was like fighting a shadow. Kimura lost that match. Kimura also had a loss to a guy, and forgive me for the pronunciations of any of these names, Kohaku Shayai, and uh, Kohaku basically caught him with a foot sweep. Kimura's fourth loss was to a guy named Yamamoto Hideo, and not much is known about this loss. Having been dealt these four losses in, in one year's time, uh, Kimura considered quitting, but decided to rededicate himself to training even harder. Six months went by. He developed an unorthodox osotogari. That's the large outer reap. It's a, it's a throwing motion. And he did this by t- uh, tying a belt to a tree, and he would just drill this over and over again. And he got so good at this, it was not uncommon for about 10 of his training partners to get concussions during training. And many of his training partners would just ask for him to not use his Osotogari. So it was a very devastating weapon. So later on, Kimura went out looking for revenge of his losses. And the first one, Osawa, the guy who gave him that concussion, he he threw him at a uh, police dojo. Later on, he found Abe Kinshiro, the very uh, small and elusive grappler, training at a uh, gym. He figured out what gym he was at, and there was like 500 judoka in there practicing uh, their judo, and and uh, Kimura, you know, got a little match with him there, and he threw him 11 times, this is according to Kimura, 11 times off the mat onto the hard floor, and six times on the mat. And this was in front of that giant audience of, of the 500 students there, and, and Abe said, I'm done. <laughs> He uh, he just he's, he said I don't want to do this anymore. And Kimura's instructor arranged for a match against Yamamoto. Uh, Yamamoto was really no uh, match for the improved Kimura. So he had uh, documented, I guess you'd say, revenge of three of the four, and uh, not much is known about the guy who was able to foot sweep him. I don't know if he could ever find him again or get another crack at it or. Uh, it just wasn't documented what happened there. Uh, also, a, a fact here about how good Kimura was. Kimura was the first student to be permitted to enter the All Japan Judo Championships in 1937. Typically, they wouldn't allow students to enter that. And he beat the two-time defending champion in the finals. It was an epic 40-minute match. It was a battle of attrition, and and it was, it was about as close as you can get. And, and uh, Kimura really saw a number of ways he could have lost that match, and he, he kind of doubled down some more and, and started training harder. Kimura held the All Japan Championship for three years, and before him, the record was uh, to hold that for two years, and that was by actually Kimura's coach. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name, Yushijama, and, uh, and Kimura did all of this, all these things I talked about before he graduated college. Well, if you've been kind of keeping your eye on the calendar as he gets older, uh, there's something that's going to affect everybody, <laughs> and that's World War II. And, you know, being in Japan, that definitely had a effect on Kimura. Uh, Japan entered World War II September 27, 1940. And Kimura started uh, his military service in the air defense on January 1st, 1942. I have a couple of interesting stories that come from Kimura's time in the military. And it's just, it, to me, it's interesting also to see uh, military history from a completely different side. As I've, I've always heard and, and seen and learned about the American side of, of World War II and, and to hear it from this. Uh, so here you have this legendary judoka entering in military service, and he's just trying to uh, more or less get by with what he has at the table and not try to live off his past accomplishments. He wants to be a, a normal 
uh, soldier and, and, you know, fight for his country. So he's in training. And one day in training, they were doing, uh, like training with a wooden gun and they call it like thrusting. So basically how to take a gun, a rifle and, you know, attach a bayonet to that and how to stab with that. And, and, and they were treating that like a martial art. So they were doing their training, their drills, and they were training with the countries, Japan's top instructor. He came in and, and he was teaching all this stuff and he was really impressive. So the instructor, towards the end of the training, asked, who's ready to fight me, you know, in a wooden gun battle? And nobody volunteered. And so Kimura's captain didn't want to be ashamed by his group. He volunteered Kimura. He said, this guy will fight you. And and Kimura's captain knew somewhat of, of his uh, past achievements in martial arts. Well, Kimura stepped up, and, and he's holding the gun incorrectly. He has a poor stance. He... A total amateur out there. He's not even holding the gun correctly. He He's about to get destroyed in this thing. And he was really set up for failure. And they bowed, and Kimura didn't... He didn't really want to start the attack because he knew that the instructor would counterattack pretty much immediately, and, and he would receive the worst end of that. So in the heat of the moment, something clicked in Kimura, and he solved this problem. He took his gun... And he threw it at his instructor's face. Then he took him down and basically uh, mounted him and then removed the instructor's face guard. And as it was getting ready to hit the instructor, and the captain stepped in and stopped the action from getting any more uh, vicious. Hearing this story, this is what happens when you take a man like Kimura and put him in a spot like this. He's going to find a way to win or at least he's going to find a way to not lose badly. And in this case, uh, he, he won, and he didn't know how this would be received. He didn't know if he'd get in trouble. He didn't know what would happen there. But both the instructor and the captain were amazed by this tactic, and they, they gave Kimura a lot of respect for what he did uh, when pushed in that spot. There also was a day in, in Kimura's military history where uh, they were looking for volunteers, and, and you would get rewarded with some, some time off if you volunteered. And uh, Kimura volunteered to, to join in this attack, uh, and they were going to go to the Solomon Islands. Kimura's captain said, don't, don't do this attack. This is, this is not good. The plan is reckless. And Kimura said, I, I want to do this. I want to do this attack. And, and he... Uh, he, de- he declined his captain's offer to let him withdraw his name from this. Then the captain ordered him to withdraw his name with the power of the emperor, uh, <laughs> which I don't really understand the, the, the system back then, but that's a pretty big deal. And Kimura respectfully withdrew his name uh, from the application. And the, Kimura's captain did this because he knew who Kimura was. He respected him. And this, this attack was horrible. They, over 500 men died in the attack. One survived. So 501 odds, Kimura probably would have been uh, in the 500 pile just by statistics. Even if you're Kimura and you're super tough and you're a smart guy, uh, it's just bad odds. And so one survived, and he was badly burned. He managed to swim to a nearby island. And I look at this, and it's really Kimura's judo skills, although he didn't use them in that moment, they they had him stand out from the crowd. And undoubtedly, that's why Kimura lived through this. His instructor said, you're more valuable alive than going on this, uh, this foolish attack. Please stay behind. And Kimura declined and then, okay, no, stay behind. And then, you know, Kimura didn't really have a choice at that point in time. So his judo saved his life. And, and you could look back at the, at the childhood knife fights. Did it save his life? It darn well might have saved his life. But here in this situation, it definitely uh, took him out of a really bad spot. And during this time uh, that he was in the military service, he was allowed to teach some judo. He definitely wasn't training like uh, the madman he was when he was uh, doing all his weight training, his cardio training, and endless repetitions with the, the, the tree and drilling that stuff. He couldn't train at that level, but nobody could. But he was still able to teach and do a little bit of judo. Kimura got married during World War II, and on his wedding night, uh, roughly 300 B-29s attacked Kimura's town. 
and the explosions woke him up. It was very violent. Uh, he he hid his parents and his new bride under some straw mats. And uh, Kimura commented about this, and he said, My peaceful town was changed into a hell in a moment. Fortunately, my family managed to escape the hell. So that was just a glimpse of what the war was like uh, for Kimura. You know, some a, a story from his training time, a story uh, from when he volunteered for basically certain death, and and then also uh, it hit home and and a good chance, you know, just by luck, uh, a bomb did not land where his family uh, was huddled in, in hiding. After World War II, the authorities that were occupying Japan said, "Hey, we're banning judo." As a result, Kamura was forced to stop training for a bit, and he, he, you know, he did what anybody would do in the situation. He tried to find work. He was a broker in coal sales. He did a little bit of bodyguard work and other things, and he just kind of struggled to find his purpose. and And the U.S. occupied Japan from 1945 to 1952, and in 1947, the U.S. controls of the judo ban kind of began to loosen up and. And Kimura was able to compete again in 1947, and he won a much-needed cash prize. Kimura also competed in the All Japan Championship of 1949, uh, where he fought in the finals to a draw in a match that most people think he probably should have won. His opponent was largely uh, escaping and running outside the ring and kind of trying to uh, not lose, I would say. But ultimately, in the late 40s, uh, his judo kind of rebounded and and uh, it, it got built back up, and it was helpful. But Kimura struggled to pay the bills, and a big reason why is his wife got sick. Now, Kimura had a prestigious job uh, working for the police department and teaching them judo, and he had two kids and a wife, but he did struggle to pay the bills. The job was prestigious, but it wasn't well-paying. And then when his wife got sick... It became impossible to cover all the expenses and get her uh, the medicine and the nutrition that she needed to do well. So Kimura took a job with a professional judo organization, and they were going to go international. And what happened was Kimura went to Hawaii, where he would fight like 10 challengers in a row. And the Japanese crowd really enjoyed watching a man from Japan defeat these American challengers rather easily. So it kind of brought a crowd together. And if you can imagine, uh, if you've trained, if you train jujitsu, what would it be like to take one of the top jujitsu people around and have them grapple, you know, big, strong, tough people that know nothing of jujitsu? Not, it wouldn't be that difficult. And that was really Kimura. He was a, one of the best uh, with judo and he would go in and he would say, you know, give me some challengers and they would get these big American guys. And the, the Japanese public in Hawaii loved watching this because, yeah, they just got beat in World War II. And, and this is like a little way to show some pride in their country and, and to really watch the tables get turned on these uh, Americans. And so Kimura made good money with this pro judo circuit, and he eventually switched to pro wrestling. And he made even more money. In today's money, uh, he would have made about $38,000. And he was able to buy the, the medicine uh, to treat his wife's tuberculosis and, and get her healthy again. And, and so that was a big uh, moment for him, I, I would imagine, in his life when, when that was able to happen. So that kind of brings us up to Kimura. He's traveling around. He's using his skills to make money. He ends up in Hawaii, and he's, he's doing that, making good money. And shortly after this, we're going to meet up with Elio Gracie, and so let's, let's talk about Helio just a little bit. This is more of a Kimura story. Surely you could fill an entire podcast talking about Helio Gracie, but I just want to bring you up to a little bit of speed about him. Uh, he was born October 1st, 1913, and he passed away January 29, 2009. When Helio was a boy, he was considered too frail for jiu-jitsu. So they, they wouldn't let him, you know, do jiu-jitsu, but he was very interested. And at the age of 16, he started to teach. Uh, one of Carlos's students uh, was at the gym waiting for Carlos, and Carlos was late. So he started to teach the guy. And he had just absorbed so much of it just by watching and being, you know, kind of involved from the sidelines uh, that he, he said, I'll, I'll teach you today. Carlos is, is not here quite yet. 
Due to his size, he really focused on technique. And the student really liked the way Helio taught. So he, that kind of, uh, at the age of 16, was a, was a turning point, I would, I would say, for Helio, that he started to actually be involved in something that he was very interested in. Now, his family was very involved in jiu-jitsu. I mean, it, it's the Gracie family. Uh, and they would regularly challenge tough guys and other martial artists uh, to different, you know, assortment of matches and, and rule sets. And, and they would try to prove the effectiveness of their jiu-jitsu. And, and Helio got involved in this. And he, he had uh, of many fights against a variety of opponents. And most of his opponents enjoyed a, a considerable size advantage. And like it was said early on, he didn't even, they wouldn't even let him train. He was too frail. And he was always kind of a smaller uh, grappler you know, throughout his career. And Elio liked the challenge the best. And uh, he was a bit of a showman, and he liked to, to, to put his name out there and try to get the best to, to get in there and compete with him. Hey, he challenged Joe Lewis in 1950. And if you're not knowledgeable about boxing, Joe Lewis was the heavyweight champion of the world from 1937 to 1949. So from 37 to 49, Joe Lewis put those gloves on, heavyweight champion, he was considered uh, the greatest heavyweight boxer of all time. And what did Helio do? He said he would fight him under any conditions, anywhere, anytime, with or without gloves, with or without payment. Man, uh, that's just somebody out there, just he's ready to go. And it's not like Helio was, you know, a big guy. He's that small framed jujitsu guy challenging the heavyweight champion of the world uh very just impressive the way he, he put his name out there uh, joe lewis how this went down he was not interested in mixed fighting he challenged Helio to a boxing match and Helio said no and Helio was able to kind of kick up a story in the news and and conversation about you know what would happen and and that sort of thing and 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 one editor said you know what if Helio was serious he would give up on trying to challenge these boxers and he would challenge some authentic black belts from Japan. And this is kind of just a hint of what's to come. Another big match that, that Elio was involved in was with a guy, I'm, I'm going to mispronounce his name, Lufaldo Carbide, we'll call him Carbide, uh, a.k.a. the Marvel of Bahin. And Carbide had a record of 28-1, and the one loss was a disqualification. And Carbide said, hey, Helio, I challenge you to a death match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, and you know what? Total gangster move. He just said, yep, let's do it. I gave a kid's tip earlier about if a guy asks you to do business with you, a kid says, hey, I got business with you. Don't, don't follow that kid. Here's another tip for the kids. Don't sign up for a death match. Even if you think you will win, don't do it. It's not worth it. On a side note, in reality, street fights are basically potentially death matches so also don't get in street fights back at us so uh carbide says hey helio i'll fight you let's do a death match style and helio says yes <laughs> so let's kind of recap some of the action in this one here carbide started by pulling in close guard and helio attempted several chokes from within carbide's closed guard uh, carbide was able to wiggle off the mat and get a reset and in this, in this manner, it's documented that Carbide defended about four chokes from Helio. And if you, if you don't do jujitsu, I'll tell you right now, that choking somebody from within their guard is ineffective. And it's actually dangerous for you, the top player, as you try to attack their neck with your, with your hands. The defender of the choke, so the person on the bottom or Carbide in the situation, they have way too many tools to... Uh, deal with your attack to get out of the choke uh, not to mention they can uh, try to attack your arms they could arm bar you and and sweep you there's a lot of things that this bottom player could do to deal with you trying to do a choke from within their guard i, I don't want to say that this is this wasn't good jujitsu but you could watch jujitsu matches for days on end and you would not see anybody attempting a choke 
from within somebody's closed guard. And if you do see somebody attempting this type of a choke, they're going to be white belts. And also look for their coach yelling at them to stop. So when I was reading this and, and learning about this, this was very surprising that that Helio was trying to do this type of a choke. Eventually, Helio passed Carbide's guard and finished with a choke. I say eventually, but the fight took about four minutes. And at this time, Carbide tapped. <laughs> you know, you sign up for a death match and you tap. The fans were really disappointed <laughs> that nobody died. And, uh, and Carbide got up and he immediately wanted a rematch right then, right now. I'm ready for a rematch. And Helio said, yeah, we'll fight again. This time, I'm going to tie one or both of my hands behind my back. And that was kind of a theme that they would do. That sometimes they'd, they'd challenge that. And nobody ever accepted these because it was such a bad deal for the, anybody. If if Helio could beat you with one hand or with no hands, that's just terribly embarrassing. And if you were able to beat him, well, he didn't even use his hands. <laughs> so it was a lose-lose situation. Nobody, I don't, I don't, I couldn't find any situation where somebody accepted one of those fights. And there's a quote about this fight from a guy named Carlos Pereira, and I'm going to talk about Carlos Pereira a few times in this in this podcast, and just to help you separate his name from others, Pereira. It can be translated to pear tree. So here, Pereira, remember, Carlos Pereira, pear tree, and uh, I'll bring him up a couple of times later on. But in Carlos's opinion, Carbide did not have the capability to test Gracie. They were just in, in different leagues, basically. You know, thinking about this and, and thinking the match was four minutes long and Elio was, was kind of messing around and trying to choke him from within his own guard – I'm trying to figure out why this is even happening. Maybe he could pull this off sometimes. Maybe he couldn't. I don't know. This also can be done by somebody who is very confident that you can't do anything about it. So all the counterattacks and all the things that that, that Carbide maybe could have done, Elio just didn't care because he knew it wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and so that kind of opened him up to try some, some things that would be a little bit unorthodox. Uh, side note, conclusion to this thing. It's likely, uh, looking at the research, that Carbide had a ruptured meniscus before the fight. Did the fight anyway. Like I said, I can go on and on about Elio, and we could do a whole episode on him. But uh, one other thing I found interesting that I did not know about him before is that he was given the Medal of Honor for his actions while on a cruise ship. So uh, he was on a cruise ship off the coast of Brazil, and a man jumped overboard trying to kill himself. And so a crew of five sailors went after the guy in a little boat, and they, they get out there, and, and they, they get to the guy, and the water's rough. They can't get him into the boat. Elio seeing that they needed somebody to be in the water. It's like he saw the mechanics of, of how, how the bodies were working and how the water was, and, and he maybe just saw something that they didn't see with his vast experience of, of – you know, think about jiu-jitsu. It's pushing people around. It's moving bodies. It's doing that sort of thing. He's like, you need to get somebody in the water to get this guy in the boat. So Helio jumped in the water, swam about 700 feet through these shark-infested, crazy waters uh, that were known for being a bad spot to be in the water. The five guys in the boat had basically given up. They started headed back. And he goes, oh, I'll get him. And so the boat had to turn around. And with, with Helio being the man in the water, was able to get the guy in the boat and save him to rescue him. And... Uh, and I don't understand for sure, but the Standard Oil Company was the one that awarded him the Medal of Honor, and that's a weird thing. I can't really find anything on uh, online about that either. But it's a crazy story, and, and it shows a lot of heart and bravery and and, and trying to help somebody out, and uh, you know, self sacrifice and, and taking a big risk for a big reward. And and I thought that was a very interesting story. So I brought us up to speed here. We've got Elio Gracie and. And Masahiko Kimura, and we're basically to the point where we're going to meet uh, and have this match. And, and we're going to bring back that video in those 12 facts that I had mentioned earlier on anyway. But before the match, Helio had a match with Kato. And this was mentioned in that video that he, that he choked him out in six minutes. And you got to ask yourself, why did this match happen? Some people thought that maybe Kimura wanted this match to happen so he could watch Elio in action and see what he was doing. And, and some say that Kimura wanted the match to happen so that 
that Kato could beat Helio, and, and they were very similar in size, and that Helio could not claim that it was caused by the size difference. So both these theories that, that Kimura wanted to watch his style or Kimura wanted him to face somebody his own size and get beat that way, those both make sense. But uh, financially, the decision for uh, Elio to fight Kato does not make sense. The, the big money match is with Kimura. And if he gets beat by the guy who happens to be traveling with Kimura uh, as, a, as like a side, there's, why, why would he get to fight Kimura? So... They actually fought twice. Uh, the first match was September 6, 1951. The second match was September 29th. And the first match ended in a three-round draw. The second match, so 23 days later, Helio choked out Kato uh, with a lapel choke from his guard. So so Kato threw Helio, and uh, they ended up on the mats, and, and that's where he caught that choke. And that choke is in that video, and you can see it there. And here's what happened. After Kato lost that fight, the popularity of the pro wrestling show plummeted. Many of the Japanese fans thought that they were fake and it was just all big phony thing and Helio exposed this and Helio's popularity went up and he became somewhat of a national hero at this time for beating this Japanese black belt Kato. So that kind of sets the stage for the match with Kimura. So how big of a match was this? How, how big of a, of a crowd would assemble for this? Well, the president of Brazil showed up. That's one way to, to say how, how big or how interesting this was. Estimates say that there is 200,000 people that were in attendance. And it took place in the Metacanot Stadium. This is one of the biggest stadiums in the world. Now, I questioned the, the 200,000 number, so I did some Googling. It sounds like a lot of people to watch a grappling match. I Googled, you know, how, okay, let's see. How big can a, can a crowd get? And I Googled uh, the world's largest stadium attendance. And wouldn't you know it was in this very stadium? It was, it was Brazil versus Uruguay in the World Cup final. June 16, 1950, so a little over a year later, same stadium, about the same amount of people. It might have got close to 200,000 people to watch this match. It's just hard for me to comprehend that big of a crowd. So you have people so far away to watch this, and there's no big screen TVs up for everybody to watch. You're, you end up high in the stadium. It, it'd be hard to watch two people in a soccer field grapple, right? So it, it's just kind of a wild thought, but it's definitely possible. Regardless of if it was 200,000 people or 100,000 people, it was big enough to attract the president of Brazil. Uh, the, the day of the, the match, you know, Kimura gets in there. He's greeted with a coffin and and raw eggs are thrown at him and and. If you watch fights that take place about this time frame in Brazil, people throw stuff a lot. And I, I could not imagine being in a foreign country you know, back then. When, 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 when Comor would travel to another country, it was like he left on the first of the month. He got to that country on the sixth. Like it, that's a big deal to travel uh, that far and across an ocean. And to be, to be so far from home and to be greeted with a coffin – in a match like that would get under my head that would get into my head and uh it, it messed with me a little bit but you know what Kamor has survived several knife attacks and he's had countless high profile matches he found the coffin thing to be kind of funny and uh that's it didn't bug him one bit and just before the fight here so we're we are in the stadium now and just before the fight the gracies refused to accept the referee uh assigned by the the organization running it, the FMP, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce what those stand for, but that's who's running it, and they assigned a referee, and they said, nope, we don't want him. And there was a lot of back and forth about who, is, who a referee would be, and it, this really annoyed the fans. It caused a big delay, and, you know, well, well let's see who Kimura wants, you know. So they asked Kimura, what referee do you want? And Kimura, uh, he just said, any referee is acceptable. <laughs> that's, a, that's kind of a neat thing. Now, the referee, he was Carlos Pereira. That's right, pear tree guy. <laughs> and 
And he was the guy that had the, the positive quote about the carbide match. Like, carbide could not stand up to Helio's jiu-jitsu. He didn't stand a chance. And by this time, uh, they did not get along with Pereira. And uh, we'll get more onto that later. But basically, they said, he, Carlos, this guy cannot be the referee. And uh, his jiu-jitsu is inferior. He cannot do this. And they found a different person to ref the fight. It's scheduled for three 10-minute rounds. I'm going to kind of run through the uh, documented fight as far as what, what happened um, through the press and, and, uh, and, and observation. So the first round, Kimura threw Helio many times. And he was likely trying to give him a concussion. And, and Kimura claims that the mats are just too soft to get the job done. On one account, Kimura used uh, Kasukatambi, a type of side control, also called scarf hold. And that name comes from the fact that it resembles a over-one-shoulder robe worn by a priest. And he, he used this position uh, to put pressure, tons of pressure. Uh, he also used a triangle style of hold to try to crush his head. And according to Kimura, he noticed blood coming from Elio's ear. And he stopped and he asked Elio, are you okay? And Elio just replied, yes, and they continued to fight. And that, I don't know about that particular spot and what happened there for sure. I don't know of a lot of instances where uh, pressure or even a good locked-in type of triangle is going to cause ears to bleed. It's probably more from a damage of one of the throws that would cause a, a ear to bleed. Anyway, there's also a phantom choke. So we've got some documented use of a, of a side control and, and what was probably a top side triangle attempt to just kind of crush his head. And uh, and then in in 2002, about 50 years later after the fight, uh, Elio says in an interview that he says this, I've never told anyone before. It seems I went unconscious while thinking about what to do. If Kimura would have continued to choke me, I would have died for sure. But since I didn't give up, Kimura let go and went on to the next technique. Being released from the choke... And the pain of the next technique revived me. I continued to fight. Kimura went to his grave without ever knowing the fact that I was finished. That's a quote from Elio, uh, 50 years after the fight. And I call this the Phantom Choke because nobody saw it. I do find it kind of tough to believe that Kimura could grapple a person who was unconscious and not notice. And I could bring in some personal experience on this because I've been choked out, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, five or six times. One of them, I woke up after my partner let go and I continued to try to grapple. But I was, I was very confused and I had numbness in my body and I, and I was not effectively grappling. And he insisted, hey, Byron, let's stop. You know, just take a break. You, you were out. And I was like, I was out, you know, I can't hardly, yeah. And, and it, was became obvious as he uh, disengaged with me that I was still having problems, uh, you know, kind of getting my wits about me, and I was super dizzy still. And I was very fortunate that I had a, a training partner that that knew <laughs> a that I went out, and and b he didn't hold it very long. Thirdly, that I needed to take a break. So out of out of the five or six times I've been choked unconscious doing jujitsu, every time. My opponent, actually, my training partner. These weren't these aren't competition things. It was just training. These were just accidents. I I was in a spot where I figured I can get out, and I just ran out of time. I ran out of blood flow flow to the brain. If if I was stuck in a lockdown submission and the choke was tight, I definitely tap. But if I think I could wiggle out, if I think I could continue to work, I would do that. And and these times I went to sleep. Every time my opponent had to stop. And every time they had to help me kind of revive a little bit, some more than others. It's hard to grapple right after that. And it's also hard to consider that Kimura didn't know his choke put Helio unconscious. And if you don't train jujitsu, it's a little bit hard to understand. But if you're applying a submission to somebody, you've done this thousands of times. And you know where people's limits kind of are. You know how tight the armbar is. You know 
you know, with the, with the range of motion is cause based on when something like a Kimura gets tight. You know if the, if the choke you're applying is tight or not. And it's just hard for me to comprehend that Kimura can be choking somebody and not realize that not only was a choke really working really well, but the person went out. I'm not saying that that did not happen. It's a phantom choke. That's all I'm saying. And there's no documentation other than a 50 year later interview when Helio talks about it. And uh, that's the only time it really came up. And I like to see uh, any comments or, or information about people who have also been choked out and your opponent not known or your training partner did not know. That's a bad situation. So those things don't happen on the mats. Also, Kimura, he throws Helio. He throws him a lot. He, he, and he also lands that Sotogari. That's the, that's the technique the, uh, uh, that he was practicing on the tree with. He, his training partners would say, don't do this against me. Please don't do that technique on me. And he would routinely give his training partners concussions. The list of, of throws that Kimura landed is numerous. They were in different leagues. And that's really what Kimura was able to do with his judo, was just to throw people easily. And and Helio did not particularly train for that. He trained, you might think he trained more to fall without getting damaged uh, than to than to learn to, to go in there and and to try to throw Kimura. Um, now Kimura claims that, that Helio tried to, to engage with a couple of throws and they didn't even get him to move. Didn't really see that, but the fight comes to an end in the second round. And so we're at about 13 minutes total of fighting. So it's the first round, 10 minutes, that goes through. And the second round is about three minutes in. Kimura says that he tries to smother Elio with his belly. And this might be where the phantom choke comes from. This might be uh, Elio remembering this 50 years later, just just suffering and getting smothered and, and... during this process of of Kimura trying to smother him with his belly. So literally, uh, what that means to me is Kimura is trying to cover his mouth and nose with his abdomen. <laughs> like, there's no other way to say that. Just try to get the job done. Just make him quit. And and maybe Elio, you know, remembers it as blacking out, or maybe he did it for a second. I don't know. Anyway, and also you think of this. You're fighting. You're breathing super heavy, and so to have any oxygen deprivation is is it it hits you pretty quick. Covering the mouth and nose is a tremendously effective way to get somebody to move. And according to Kimura, when Elio couldn't take the pain anymore from being smothered, he pushed up with his arms onto Kimura's body, and he extended his left arm. Kimura then applied the Yudigurami. That's the Kimura, uh, that shoulder lock. And this is according to Kimura, which this is believed to be exaggerated, that, that Kimura applied the technique, the Kimura, to Elio. Elio did not tap. Kimura continued the attack, and there was cracking and popping, and, and everybody heard it. That is likely a, a pretty big exaggeration on Kimura's part uh, in, his, in his documents there. In reality, Carlos Gracie throws the towel in, is is the the term um the towel not so much he jumps in and stops the fight uh one account says that the the referee instructed the fighters to continue because carlos jumped in like what do you 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 know like that's not how to stop a fight but either way he said you know what i uh, i'm not fighting anymore um the fight was stopped on the behalf of my corner and the fight was over after the fight so let's talk about that, and then I'm going to bring up the old video and the 12 facts. After the fight, the Japanese brilliance rushed to the ring, and they held Kimura up in a triumphant way, and, and Kimura praised uh, Elio's defense, but he was disappointed that he didn't put up more of a fight. He wanted more of a little back and forth. And he also really didn't like Elio's style. He, he said before he left to the U.S. that he had never met an opponent who was so defensive and who ran away so much. Um, so those are some comments about that. Uh, despite the loss, this really boosted Elio's credibility, both at home in Brazil and, and worldwide. He, he, he got a good name from that. Kimura returned to Japan, and the, the Kodokan headquarters, so the, the higher-ups in judo, they were not happy. 
And what they were most unhappy about was he made some promotions to people. And, you know, he gave out some belts and stuff. And they didn't give him permission to do that. So they froze his promotion. They said, Kimura, you're, you're frozen right where you are. And he was 7th Dan, uh, that's his belt rank, for 40 years. And uh, later on, he... Uh, he, and we'll, we'll talk about these some more. He, he moved to, he went back to professional wrestling to make more money. He did that in Japan. He was, it, it spirals out of control there. He gets betrayed and humiliated. And, uh, we'll, we'll bring that. Let's go back to the fight here. Cause this is, this is why we know this submission as the Kimura, uh, reexamining the video, the 12 facts from the video. And I'm going to call them the stacking dozen and we're going to stack them up like bricks and and as they stack some of them hold up better than others uh, so the first fact Kimura was the best jujitsu fighter ever Henner says this in this video the fact is Kimura was not a jujitsu fighter he was a judoka he turned pro wrestler in order to make money to save his sick wife <laughs> That's it. He he was not the best jiu-jitsu fighter ever. He wasn't a jiu-jitsu fighter. So there was no such thing as a world champion of jiu-jitsu at this time. And he was well outside of his competitive prime. He's now 34. He peaked earlier. And he's now doing pro wrestling to make money. So judgment on this first fact, Kimura was the best jiu-jitsu fighter ever. False. Kimura was a judoka. And Kimura was one of the top judoka. He set several records. Not only was he not the best jiu-jitsu fighter, though, he was a jiu-jitsu fighter. So that's fact number one. Fact number two of the stacking dozen, and these are going to be in time order that he says them in the video. Uh, Kimura was going to be in Brazil, and that seems like an uneventful fact. But let's peer into it and see what we can find. I've already mentioned it, that uh, Kimura, now married, uh, his wife was sick, and he needed to try to raise the funds in order to... Uh, both provide uh, quality food and the medicine to get her past her illness uh, without her dying. For Kimura, teaching judo and doing a few competitions here and there really didn't pay the bills. So he ended up leaving Japan and he was he did a combination of pro wrestling and uh, pro judo and kind of bounced between a couple organizations there and just trying to make money. He ended up indeed making the money he needed to send back home and, and to save his wife. And a lot of this was done in in Hawaii. There's a large population of, of Japanese uh, people in Hawaii, and they really enjoyed watching uh, these top Japanese martial artists perform really well against the Americans, especially just after World War II. They really bought tickets and, and really gravitated towards that. After a while, though, the business has struggled. He ended up working for two months straight and not getting paid. So he's kind of looking and figuring out what to do next. And a newspaper in Brazil invited Kimura and, and a couple of guys to come down to Brazil and basically create news to sell their papers. And this, this the newspaper was the Sao Paulo Shinburn, and that's a Japanese newspaper in Brazil. And I, first when I read this, I'm like, why is there a Japanese newspaper in Brazil in 1950? So I looked into it a little bit. It turns out that the first... Japanese started to immigrate towards Brazil in 1908. Brazil is now the home of the largest Japanese population outside of Japan. According to the IBGE, the, that's the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics, as of 2009, there are approximately 1.6 million Japanese descendants in Brazil. And what was happening in Japan, which uh, caused a lot of people to leave, it, it was the end of feudalism uh, and that created a lot of poverty in, in the rural population. So many Japanese began to immigrate and search for better living conditions. By the 1930s, the uh, Japanese population was boosted significantly, but prospects for uh, for staying in Japan uh, were limited, which got people to uh, migrate to other countries. Now, the U.S. had a ban on non-white immigration uh, from some parts of the world, and this was the exclusion clause of 19. 19- 24 in the Immigration Act, it specifically targeted Japanese. The Australians had this, this very similar thing about uh, immigration as well. So there was there were limited places where they could go and, and experience kind of a 
uh, a chance to start over or to start a life at a new home country. And Brazil happened to be a great opportunity for many Japanese people. In 1907, the Brazilian and Japanese government signed a treaty that uh, permitted Japanese to move to Brazil. And th this was in part because Brazil had a decrease in Italian immigration um, and they needed new labor for uh, things like their coffee plantations and things like that. So they were looking for labor and Japan had an excess of people and the two governments worked together and, and ended up helping a lot of people immigrate to Brazil. So that's why you would end up with a Japanese newspaper in Brazil. And the newspaper, the Sao Paulo Shinbum, was at the time in a bit of a slump. Uh, it was They were having a hard time with sales uh, when they came up with the idea of, hey, let's bring Kimura to town. <laughs> and uh, he will, yes, he will create news, he will sell fights, and all this is going to drive newspaper sales. So the Shinbom signed a contract with Kimura, Kato, and another judoka, Yamaguchi, and uh, it, they signed a four-month contract, and it was designed to help drive the sales of the newspapers. And I don't have statistics on sales of the newspapers, but at some point in time, uh, the three of them asked for a pay raise, and they got their pay tripled on the spot. Like, that newspaper is quite happy with the investment they made bringing them to town. The arenas were packed. It was really uh, a good thing for for everybody. The, the audiences loved it. They bought newspapers. The newspaper was happy. Kimura and his guys made money. Uh, it was just a, a beneficial all around. So for the second fact of the stacking dozen, uh, the fact is Kimura was going to be in Brazil. I'm going to say it's true. Pretty simple. Kimura was not in Brazil to fight Helio. He was brought to Brazil by a Japanese newspaper to, uh, for lack of a better term, create news and to help sell newspapers. This was a brilliant move by the Japanese newspaper. If you're in a situation where you're not selling papers, make some news happen that targets your demographic audience and you'll start making money. And they really did. The second fact is uh, definitely true. The third fact. Kimura had Helio fight Kato, the number two jiu-jitsu fighter. Kimura was not a jiu-jitsu fighter, nor was Kato. So who was Kato? Kato was a black belt in judo. He was recruited to travel with Kimura and was brought to Brazil by the newspaper. As I mentioned earlier, the Shin Bum. He had no professional judo or any pro wrestling experience when he actually fought Elio. This was really his first professional thing that he got involved in. Now, Kato, uh, he was definitely not a nobody. He had won several regional and local championships in judo uh, in Japan. Very difficult thing to do. But he was nowhere near the level uh, of judo proficiency as, as Kimura was. It's unknown why this fight even happened. Uh, some say that Kato just volunteered. I'll fight him. Uh, some say, and, and Elio says this, that Kimura insisted that he fight him first. Uh, Kimura claims that Kato volunteered to fight Elio. But when you look at the whole thing, this fight does not make sense financially. If Kato wins, which he could have, Elio would never get the big fight with Kimura. I mean, if you get beat by the guy traveling with uh, <laughs> with Kimura, you don't get a you don't get a chance at Kimura. You could talk all you want to. It's not it's not gonna. And even if it happens, it wouldn't be a big fight. Kato actually believed that he was going to be able to beat Elio. He 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 heard that he was Elio was past his prime. He was easy to throw. Uh, he he had a difficult guard to pass, and it was difficult to submit him. But Kato really believed that he was capable of beating Elio. So for the fact, number three, the judgment on this one, Kimura had Elio fight Kato, the number two jiu-jitsu fighter, false. And I, I don't know for sure the first part of that sentence, Kimura had Elio fight Kato. I don't know if that's true or not. It's really hard to prove. That might be the case. The fact that you latch on the other fact, the number two jiu-jitsu fighter, that makes the whole claim false. The claim that Kato was number two jiu-jitsu fighter is a total lie. Kato didn't do jiu-jitsu. 
he wasn't a top judoka. He wouldn't he wouldn't have been a number two judo fighter. He wouldn't have been in the top ten or probably a hundred. He was a black belt in judo, and he performed at a like a kind of a regional level, never professional. This was the biggest fight of his life, and it was the first professional fight of his life. So that's the number three fact from the stacking dozen, and and that's a big one. It's you're going to start to see why these are stacking facts now that we've got these first three out of the way. Fourth fact. Helio fought Kato and choked him after six minutes. Helio and Kato fought first on September 6th, 1951. Uh, I've mentioned this before. Uh, no decision was made. Kato got lots of throws. The fight was 30 minutes long. Kimura notes that the mats were very soft, not allowing the throws to actually damage Helio. Uh, the second fight was the one that was referred to in the video, uh, September 29th, 1951. So uh, this fight was about six minutes long. They got tangled up in the ropes. Kato uh, might have thought the fight was going to be stopped. There's some controversy in there if you read about it. It's really hard to tell. Helio applied the choke and uh, choked him unconscious. So many newspapers uh, pointed out the question of whether this was a legal technique because they were out of bounds or partially out of bounds. Um, in reality, it didn't really matter. He put him to sleep. The referee didn't stop the fight. Uh, but what happened was the loss affected the troops, the, the three judoka that were there to help drum up newspaper sales, really, and make money. It was devastating financially for that, and the Japanese public began to question how legit these black belts were and, and how could this be. They saw them as a, a potential phonies and not the real thing. And, uh, and the Grace Jiu-Jitsu students would, you know, prayed around in the streets carrying a coffin to symbolize Kato's death. It was a bad thing for the team, and it really bothered Kato as well. After having fought him for 30 minutes, I don't know if he gained confidence in that, but he, I think he felt fairly safe. And the six-minute six loss with him actually getting put to sleep, it, I think from what I read, it bothered him much later in life that this, that this fight happened that way. So fact number four, judgment time here. Uh, Helio fought Kato and choked him after six minutes. False. Let's run down it here. This is a tremendously misleading statement. Kato and Helio had fought for 30 minutes went to a draw. Then they fought uh, a second time, weeks later, and Helio did choke him out in six minutes. There was controversy in this match uh, because they were fighting amongst the ropes. The statement that Helio choked out Kato after six minutes is not outright false, but it's tremendously misleading. Let's stack some of these facts and let them build on each other and see how misleading this statement actually is. The bigger fact... Uh, fact number three is that Kato was the number two jiu-jitsu fighter. Combine that with getting choked out in six minutes grossly exaggerates the speed and level of accomplishment uh, of this fight. A true statement can be made like this. Kato, a judoka, in his first professional match, fought Helio twice, once 30 minutes to a draw, the second for six minutes. With a choke... That was placed by the fighters very close to the outside of the ring. Kato was choked unconscious. That fact would be uh, very clear and, and uh, truthful, <laughs> not misleading at all. Let's look at the fifth one here. Kimura versus Helio. This would be the first time the Jiu-Jitsu Championship would be held outside of Japan. The true information in this statement is that both Kimura and Helio are fighting and they are not in Japan. Anything else in that is really hard to, to say is, is truthful. This is not a Jiu-Jitsu World Championship. That didn't exist. That, that wasn't even a thing back then. This is not to say that this was not a big fight. It was huge. It was in a huge soccer stadium in front of possibly 200,000 people. Now, also, here's a note. Uh, when, if you go searching for this online... There are some reports that say that this was in front of 20,000 people. It's missing a zero. This was driving me nuts because it, it's, it's either 20,000 people or 200,000 people. That's totally different. Uh, <laughs> it's crazy. 
And w- the best I can figure out is that Kimura in his biography in, in My Judo says the number 20,000. And so people who read just that one article, that's what they report. And it does look like this was a huge stadium. It had a large crowd. And, uh, you know, not only was this probably the biggest fight in Brazil's history, this could have been the the biggest audience in, in fight history. And it was billed really as Japan's national judo champ versus Brazilian's jiu-jitsu hero. You know, after beating Kato, he was elevated uh, to a new level and... Um, and that's that was really one of the things that was missing from Elio at the time is he's fighting all these guys in Brazil and beating them. And it's like, fight a guy from Japan. Fight a black belt from Japan. We want to see that. And he beat a guy. So that really elevated the, the, the level of the fight as well. The judgment on this fact, we're at number five here. Kimura versus Helio would be the first time the Jiu-Jitsu World Championship would be outside of Japan. False. This was not a World Championship fight. And fact number five, it does stack nicely on top of fact number one, that Kimura was the best jiu-jitsu fighter ever, so we're fighting for the world title. He was not a jiu-jitsu fighter. And also stacks on top of fact number two, that he was going to be in Brazil. That one is true. So those kind of all build together to, to get uh, fact number five a nice little a nice little platform to stack on. Fact number six, Kimura was 80 pounds heavier than Elio. Here's the, here's the truth of the matter is they didn't weigh in. And that might seem weird. This is more of a feature than a bug. They didn't forget to weigh in. They didn't want to weigh in. Helio claimed that Kimura was heavier than he was, and Kimura claimed that Helio was heavier than he was. So they both could kind of just play with the numbers a little bit, give somebody a few extra pounds, and and make yourself look a little bit better uh, should you happen to win or lose. We do know, and it's pretty obvious by looking, and just looking at historical numbers, that Kimura was both shorter and heavier than Helio. The best estimates uh, by impartial parties have Kimura being uh, 10 kilograms to 20 kilograms. So 22 pounds to 33 pounds heavier than Helio. I'm going to just say, put this aside, that doesn't matter. Kimura was so much stronger than Helio. It's It's... If you have a 200-pound person who lifts weights and a 200-pound person who doesn't lift weights, the weightlifter is going to be a lot stronger. That's Kimura. He was lifting weights well ahead of his time. He was into fitness. He he was a, a sculpted athlete. Um, <laughs> the strength difference is, is hard to compare with pounds. It's not a, it's not a good comparison anyway. And Helio focused more on technique of jiu-jitsu and less on the strength aspect of performance. And watching the match time and time again, it is clear Kamora put a lot of physical pressure on Helio. Even if they weighed the same, which they did not, Kamora would have been smashing Helio anyway. And if you've been on the mats doing jiu-jitsu or, or judo and, or wrestling, and you've grappled with a smaller person who was also stronger than you, you you could tell that that just the weight is not the biggest factor necessarily, and I, I would venture to even say Kamara was so much more fit than Helio. If he if Kamara was lighter than Helio, he still would have been stronger and 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 would have had a physical advantage in that category as well. So stacking fact number six, judgment is false. Kamara was not eighty pounds heavier than Helio. It was common for fighters not to weigh in. And then they would exaggerate their weight of their opponents. It's difficult to understand the weight difference between two people. But if you find two people who are 80 pounds different, they don't look anything alike. (laughs) So let's stack up these facts here. Because these build in importance. Not only was Kamoria heavier, so that's fact number six. It's going to go on the top of the stack. It's it's on top of the fact that he was the best jiu-jitsu fighter ever. Uh, number, Number one fact. Number two, he happened to be in Brazil. Number... Five, we're going to stack this on top of that one. This would be the first time the world championship would be outside of Japan. And then number six hits right on top of that. So we've got all those facts, each one of those builds to this number six fact that he's also 80 pounds heavier than Elio, which I deem is false. He is definitely heavier. He is definitely stronger. But 80 pounds is a bad number to, to try to throw out against this. We do have footage, and it does not look like anywhere near 80 pounds. So fact number seven. If Helio can last three minutes without giving up, Kimura said he would be the winner. This appeared to not be Kimura's goal. 
it may have been more of a pre-fight trash talking or to build the fight. In between rounds one and two, so they had a 10 minute round and then they take a break. Uh, Kimura talking to his cornerman said that the, the first round he wanted to see what he had to offer. He wanted to see what he had on the ground. He wanted to punish him. Uh, he said, the second round, I'm going to finish him. And that appears to be the way the fight really unfolded. So judgment on fact number seven, that if Helio could last three minutes without giving up, he'd be the winner? False. This makes it seem that Helio actually won in this aspect. By many accounts, Helio was toyed with in the opening of the fight. Kamora was probably not wanting to end the fight too early. He was a showman. And just take it to a modern example. If Conor McGregor says he'll knock a guy out in, in one minute and takes him three, do you see his opponent point out Conor's failures to knock him out in that minute? Like, that's that's kind of what we're at here on this one. Let's stack this fact up. Uh, number seven. And so we have the stack from last time of the first fact that Kamora was the best jiu-jitsu fighter ever. The second fact, he was going to be in Brazil. Uh, the fifth, this was going to be the first time uh, that the Jiu-Jitsu World Championship would be outside of Japan. The sixth one, that he was 80 pounds heavier. And and to me, I don't put this fact on top of all of them right now, is it kind of shakes all these facts. Because it makes it seem like Kimura didn't just want to win, he wanted to win in a certain time frame. And anything less than that would be a bit of a moral victory for Elio. In reality, nobody really knows if he said that. This fact is said because it softens the blow of the actual defeat. And looking at Kimura's actions, he was not trained in the fight within three minutes. Fact number eight is that Kimura grabbed and ragdoll Helio. According to Kimura, when the match started, Helio attempted a couple of uh, setups for throws that did not get Kimura to move. And <laughs> this is the thing. Uh, having uh, done a little bit of, of judo or a little bit of the throw aspects of judo, sometimes if the if the person has a really good base or they're, or they're a solid judoka, my attempts don't even get them to take a step or get them to be off balanced. It's just, and I picture that's kind of what it was like. It was Helio trying to do a throw and Kimura just watching against one of the best judoka from Japan, a little past his prime, uh, that could easily be the case. Not to mention that he is heavier. And, and, and I talked about all the weight stuff earlier, but that's also a it's a bigger factor, I think, standing up. These throws are, are hard. And, and Kimura has talked about throwing bigger people, and it's difficult. But he, he could do it sometimes, and, 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 and it's a great uh, challenge. But it's a lot easier to throw a smaller person. <laughs> it's a lot easier to choke a person who's larger. Like, it's not that it's a big factor. But to pick somebody up, lift them with your body and throw them, that's difficult. This would have been a very difficult thing to do if Helio had a similar judo skill as Kimura because Kimura was bigger. He was also shorter. I think that's an advantage in judo to be a little bit shorter, harder to get underneath his hips. So the statement that Kimura grabbed and ragdolled Helio. Uh, it's a fact. You know, Kimura lists half a dozen of his throws uh, um, that he did to Helio. He's just he's just going through the book here. He's just hitting him with 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 a lot of variety and, and having a good time out there, it sounds like. So we have a quote from Carlos Pereira. And you remember him uh, earlier speaking. Uh, his last name means pear tree, uh, translated. So we discussed him a little bit. He thought the fight was not even at all. He said it was like a cat tormenting a mouse. Carlos was supposed to be the actual referee for this fight. That fell through. The Gracies claimed that uh, Pereira was morally and technically deficient with his jiu-jitsu. Even though he had been training as a student and some time as a teacher at the Gracie Academy for 10 years. Uh, the real problem with, with Carlos Pereira was that he withdrew from a tournament he, his team did in 1950, and it hurt uh, the Gracie's plan. So uh, the, the, rewind a little bit here. They were upset with him and two other schools because the Gracie organized a tournament uh, for the students to compete. Midway through the tournament, the Gracies are are subbing guys in and out for other other players and kind of picking things and and kind of manipulating the brackets a bit. Carlos was just like, I'm not going to subject my students to this, and I'm not going to be marketing 
for your promotion of your school. This isn't a fair tournament. He says all his students are leaving. And two other schools also did that. And so that kind of left a bad taste in the Gracie's mouth as far as who this guy was. Carlos probably wasn't much happy with them either for uh, manipulating the brackets. Like if you, uh, you know, you fight the first guy from the school, you beat him, and then you fight the second guy from the school, and you beat him, and you look at the third guy, okay, I have him tomorrow. And you come to come to the, the tournament, and it's somebody else entirely, and he's way better. Something happened there, and that's what was kind of happening uh, behind the scenes in this tournament that was prior to this date. So they had they definitely had beef with with Carlos Pereira. But if you remember, uh, Helio had a fight with Carbide. Remember that death match? Carlos Pereira had a quote about that. He said that Carbide did not have the capability to even test Helio Gracie. So th- there's kind of an interesting look at one person saying that Carbide couldn't stand up against Helio Gracie, and the same person later on saying that Helio Gracie could not stand up against Kimura. It was cat and mouse. I have some more quotes. I'll just kind of run past you here. Uh, Ultima Hora said that Kimura did not have a chance to show his skills due to the weak opposition offered by Elio. Here's another quote by a Brazilian magazine. At no time was Gracie in the position to escape, let alone initiate an attack. And that was Revista de Sima. It's a magazine. Augusto Cordero, who was classified as a jiu-jitsu expert, felt that the weight difference was not an influence on the outcome. The fight was not impressive because Helio was unable to attack Camora. Uh, Augusto, a side note here also, uh, was one of the other coaches that withdrew, withdrew his team from that tournament um, earlier on that seemed to be unfair for his students. So maybe didn't have the most favorable opinion of Helio at the time. But in all accounts, judgment on this one, the fact, as stated, that Kamora grabbed and ragdolled Helio, my judgment on that is true. Uh, according to eyewitness accounts and what little bit of footage you see from the video, not only did Helio not show offense, he could not defend what Kamora was doing. A note here about the video, the highlights, they only show one throw. And of all the little clips in this video, it only has one throw. It does appear that Kimura did many throws and <laughs> say what you want. The vision of somebody throwing somebody many times is kind of like getting ragdolled, <laughs> visually speaking. So this fact really agrees with a couple of other facts. So it stacks nicely on the fact that uh, Kimura was the best jiu-jitsu fighter ever and the fact that he was 80 pounds heavier than Elio. Man, these, these stack up nicely to make a nice story. Fact number nine Kamora would attempt a submission, but Helio would defend. Here we have to face the reality that most of the fight footage is lost. Kamora claimed to put on a show for the Japanese fans in the first round and used the second round to end the fight with a submission. Reading from Kamora, it is confirmed that Helio did escape one attack, uh, according to Kamora. Uh, it was when Kamora was smothering him with his stomach, Helio turned his head, and extended his left arm to create space to breathe, uh, thus escaping the smothering uh, submission that was in front of him. So that's one confirmed, uh, written about, documented submission attempt that was escaped. 23 years later, Kamora had a quote saying, I won the contest, but I couldn't feel like that I'd also lost implying that Helio was more difficult to submit than he expected. So, you know, again, applying uh, to that uh, defense of Helio, uh, th- this quote is widely followed by the fact that Japanese talking about fights are very modest, and that's a cultural trait. They don't want to brag about things like that. In the past, I've been thinking of these facts more as like little bricks that could stack on top of each other. Fact number seven, put that brick on there, and the fact number seven is if Helio could last three minutes without giving up, he'd be the winner. Uh, fact number eight is the ragdoll fact that uh, he got ragdolled by Kimura. So <laughs> to visualize this, uh, you, you can stack these three bricks in number nine on top of number eight. But really, number eight should be like a little pointy triangle, like a little pyramid, because number nine does not sit nicely on top of fact number eight. Because fact number nine is the one we just did, that he would attempt a submission and he would defend. That is not getting ragdolled. Those two don't go together. Either you're getting ragdolled and the person submits you when they want to, or you're escaping things. 
So these these fact number eight and fact number nine kind of contradict each other a little bit. I'm going to give Elio the benefit of the doubt's judgment on this fact that he would escape submissions is true. Because of the bare minimum of fact that he at least turned his head and pushed up to escape being smothered, that's technically an escape. Doesn't really do anything in Jiu-Jitsu. You don't get a point for that. There's no, you know, like, not that there were points back then anyway. But uh, this match I would describe as linear. So there's there's several different types of matches, or how they progress anyway. Linear is we start off at one point and we go in one direction until the match ends. Uh, and that's really what this was. At hearing from Kamara wasn't in any danger. If you were a grappler, you could think of a linear match as... Um, somebody takes this will be you and losing it somebody t- somebody takes you down that's good for them they pass your guard they they get to mount and they submit you with a choke the entire match went in one direction a circular match would be someone takes you down you get back up you take them down they get back up like you're kind of it's more of a battle there's back and forth there a uh, figure eight style of match would be uh, a lot more chaotic. Uh, someone's going to get up several points. Someone's going to have some submission attempts. They're going to they're going to get out. Maybe the other person gets some submission attempts. You see this a lot in the lower level uh, matches. And then the the spiral uh, downward match. <laughs> it's like linear linear, but uh, I'd say significantly worse. Instead of going in a straight direction, it just it just everything that happens is considerably worse than what was happening uh, a little bit ago. And if you've trained at all, you've experienced that, especially when you're new. If if you want to, you know, get your coach or get one of the competent grapplers to grapple with you and, and send you down that spiral, everything that you attempt works out poorly and then ends in you getting submitted. So those are some different matches. I would describe this as linear. Um, you know, never did he escape anything really significant. Um, Kamura was always winning and it progressed in a linear fashion to the end of the match. A little tangent there on the types of matches, but it's kind of interesting to see them. And that works the same. You could do that with MMA. You could say this is kind of a, a crazy figure eight style of match, or this is a circular match. They so just go back and forth, and the, the, you see a pattern repeating itself. Let's get to fact number 10. Carlos Gracie threw in the towel due to a shoulder lock. Yes, this happened. Carlos stopped the fight. It's unclear how much damage was done from the shoulder lock. It's likely that his arm never broke. Kimura claimed it broke, but the Brazilian newspapers did not mention it. Helio n- denied that it was broken. Kimura claims in his biography that he it was popping and more popping, and he kept thinking he would quit. But all, all looks of things is that his arm did not break from this uh, Kimura submission. Helio opened up an academy in six months, and he was training then, and if Kimura had, had broken Helio's arm, there would likely be a record of that. And there would probably be pictures of Helio in a sling, just some sort of proof that it actually happened. Now, the semantics of Carlos throwing in a towel, <laughs> uh, he actually just ran across the mat and uh, tapped on Kimura's back to stop the fight. So there's definitely a little bit of question whether Helio's arm was broken. Kimura states... Uh, that yes, after there's much bone breaking and popping sounds, the, the towel was thrown in, but in all other aspects, that that did not happen, and it was just he was caught in that submission, and his brother stopped the fight. So my judgment on this one, true. Carlos stopped the fight. And think about it. You're watching your brother get ragdolled in a fight. He stopped the fight before he got damaged. Towel or no towel, I don't really care about that. That's it's a figure of speech. Somebody throws in the towel, somebody starts a fight. This judgment on fact number ten, Carlos uh, Gracie threw in the towel. It's true. So this fact sits nicely on the first fact that he was the best judo fighter ever. The sixth fact that he was eighty pounds heavier. The eighth fact that he got ragdolled, and uh, and that and there we go. That uh, the towel was thrown in, and that's a big one to me. Is that it was his brother. You are watching your brother get beat up, basically. And it looks like he's going to get his arm broken. You stop the fight. You save him. I don't know. Maybe he would have never tapped, and he would have had serious damage on his arm. It, it did appear his arm, when they stood up, he was holding it funny. You know, like, it, it, it was more than I would be comfortable doing to somebody or having done to myself. That's for sure. <laughs> so let's go to fact number 11. 
Elio never expected to beat Kimura. Out of all the 12 facts that come out of this video, this one seems ridiculous. When I first wrote this down, I'm like, well, that's false. It's silly. First off, who would take a fight that he thought he would lose? Helio B. Kato. He's the number two jujitsu fighter. He probably thought he could beat Kimura, the number one. That's, that's what the video makes you feel, that after being the number two guy, the number one guy is within range. But Helio knew that Kato was not the number two jujitsu fighter. He knew that he wasn't the number two judoka. And he also knew that he had a tough fight with Kato. My problem with this fact, the fact that Helio never expected to beat Kimura, is that I can't read someone's mind. And Helio only mentioned it way after the fight. How could I possibly know what he was thinking? So my judgment on this one is surprising. It's true. And I know it seems crazy. How am I reading someone's mind? How do I know that Helio didn't expect to actually beat Kimura? To fully examine this fact, we need to peek into Helio's mind a little bit, but we can also peek into the past. Helio wasn't trying to win in the way you would think, you know, by submitting Kimura. That wasn't really his goal. His goal was to get a, quote, moral victory. Many of Helio's past fights versus larger opponents, he would just hold out long enough to get a draw. And then he would claim moral victory. Helio had fights with guys like Fred Ebert and Waldeck Zabisco, who outweighed him. Fred was a pro wrestler, 60 pounds heavier than Helio. The, the police stopped the fight after two hours, uh, and this sounds like a crazy thing, but really, uh, the promoter wanted the fight to be done, so the police had to come in there and stop the fight. And Waldeck was another pro wrestler who was 80 pounds heavier than Helio. Helio pulled guard. And that was the action for the whole fight for 20 minutes. It was a guard pull, and 20 minutes ticked by. You lost that off of your life. Both of these, Elio claimed moral victories for. Is that these huge guys couldn't finish him. Well, if the fight's a draw, he wins. So likely, Helio was trying to get a moral victory off of Kimura. So this fact, and I'm going to stack some facts up here, is contrary to fact number three and four. And, and facts number three or four are the ones about Kato, uh, that Kato was number two jiu-jitsu fighter and that, uh, that uh, Helio beat him in six minutes. The fact that Helio never expected to beat Kimura, well, if you just beat the number two guy, you probably have a chance. So that kind of makes you think, well, maybe he didn't actually beat the number two jiu-jitsu fighter in six minutes. <laughs> and now it's fighting the number one. So that those don't mesh well together. But we can stack number 11 on, on a bunch of other facts. Number one, that Kimura was the best jiu-jitsu fighter. Uh, number two, he's going to be in Brazil, so it's his hometown crowd. Uh, number five, it's a world championship match. Um, number six, 80 pounds heavier. Uh, number 10, his, his brother could stop the fight, uh, and he would not have to quit. We have number 11 on, the stats on top of that, but really number 11 stacks on a whole different fact altogether. It's his history of past moral victories. If you're bigger than him, and he... Hangs with you because he's a super tough guy. There's no nobody says that. Like I could not imagine getting thrown by Kamora twice because after the first throw I'd quit. <laughs> I give it that. Like I've been thrown by local judo players, and it's it's a wild experience to be thrown by one of the best ever. Repeatedly, tough as nails. No one's going to say anything different. But looking at the past. What he would do is just go out there and tough out a match. I think he was going for that. So he didn't expect to be able to beat Kimura, but he did expect to be able to walk away with a moral victory, and that would have made him a superstar. The last fact here, and it's just gets us to 12, <laughs> is that uh, Elio is the definition of a warrior, a fighter, a modern-day samurai. You could, I guess I can go define what a warrior is and what a fighter is and what a modern-day samurai is, and we can go down that list. But in reality, this just reminds me that this is a commercial. My judgment on fact number 12 is sure. <laughs> it's more of, a, of an opinion than anything else. I would say he's definitely a fighter. That would be more accurate. He's an amazing marketer and a great businessman. That's super high on the list of things that he was good at. Uh, th the thing is, I don't like to use the term warrior unless you're fighting 
outside of a sport. I prefer to use it for the, the men and women who are in the armed forces. It's kind of a, a special term for me that I uh, I don't like to say that I'm, you know, people will say that they're going to war, you know, they're going to a jiu-jitsu tournament. I don't, I don't use that either. Um, you're definitely not at war in a jiu-jitsu tournament. You're doing jiu-jitsu. You're definitely not at war in an MMA match. You have a referee there that's there to protect you. You're, I reserve the, the I don't like the warrior term. <laughs> definitely a fighter. Modern day samurai, sure. Uh, but, you know, under the definitions of warrior, yeah, it fits. The first one is a person uh, engaged or experienced in warfare, a soldier. The second one, a person who shows great vigor, courage, and aggressiveness. And this could be in politics or athletics as well. Like, okay, yeah, he definitely fits that definition. So uh, this fact stacks on all of the facts together, uh, but it's weightless. It's wordplay. It doesn't mean anything. It's just giving somebody a compliment. Now, I, I'm not trying to, do, to downplay any of Helio's accomplishments. And I know I've benefited greatly from what he's brought to the world and, and made big. And, and jujitsu is a huge part of my life. But it reminds me that this video of him talking about his grandfather is not an objective video at all. It's a commercial. It's a way to brag. It's a way to talk about the past in a favorable way. He, he could have said all the same things about Kimura. You know, Kimura, warrior, fighter, modern-day samurai. <laughs> sure, it's just wordplay. Those titles don't really mean anything. So there's the 12 facts, and I hope you were able to kind of visualize how uh, some facts would affect the way you viewed the next fact. And sometimes they would stack on top of each other, and sometimes they would they would not stack well and make you question the other facts because it doesn't make sense for this or that. The one about him not expecting the win was a shocker. And not only a shocker that I could actually believe that was the case. I'm not a mind reader. But the fact that it it turned out to be, yeah, that's likely a truth uh, coming out of this video. One more thing about this video on the uh, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Academy. Uh, all these, these 12 facts come from there. And I've also heard these facts come from other things. In, the, in doing my research for this, I ordered the Gracie in Action DVD on Amazon. You can get one yourself. It's it's as deceptive as <laughs> this video is. Uh, but if you're interested in watching old fight footage, there's some stuff there. And there, many of these facts, seven of them, were also represented in that video. And it's almost like Henner just borrowed these facts without you know, looking them up any more than, than just watching the Gracie in Action videos. Uh, the fact, okay, I'll go down the list here. Kimura was the best jiu-jitsu fighter ever. That was in the Gracie in Action video. Kimura was going to be in Brazil. That one's pretty evident, but it's there. Kimura had Elio fight Kato, the number two jiu-jitsu fighter. So in the same video that, that you can get in Gracie in Action, uh, it has uh, Kimura and Elio. also has Elio fighting Kato. And he says that in that fight. Uh, fact number four here, and this is the only what I would define as like uh, like a hard fact. Um, you know, like because one of my facts, you can go to number eight. Uh, Kimura got or Helio got ragdolled. That's not a hard fact. That's a that's kind of a statement of an opinion. But um, this fact that that Helio fought Kato and choked him for after six minutes. That is the only like statistical fact that is not represented in the Gracie in Action video. So going down the list, number five, would be the first time the uh, Jiu-Jitsu World Championship would be held outside Japan. That was in there. Kimura's 80 pounds heavier than Elio. That's in there. And uh, if Elio could last three minutes without giving up, Kimura said that he that Elio would be the winner. That's in there. The ragdoll thing is not in there. That's number eight. Number nine. That uh, Kamora would attempt a submission and Elio would defend. He did not mention anything, anything like that in the Gracie in Action video. That the towel was thrown in due to a shoulder shoulder lock. That was not in there. Uh, here's my <laughs> the most interesting fact. I think Elio never expected to beat Kamora. That was in the uh, Gracie in Action video. So yes, on that one. 
And then the definition of a warrior fighter, modern day samurai, that was not in there. So really the, the more sturdy facts, whether they're true or false, the less opinion-y facts, uh, all of them except for the six minute match with Kato are represented in the Gracie in action video. And if you, if you know, you're talking to somebody like your coach or somebody who's been around for a while, they might know these facts from that video instead of the uh, YouTube video on the Gracie in action YouTube page. So putting all these facts aside, what are we watching when we watch the video, the fight video? The match we know is set for three 10 minute rounds. We know that it ended in the second round. As I watched the fight footage time and time again, it dawns on me that we're not watching a highlight reel of the fight. Uh, there's a lot of cuts. When a cut is made, uh, and then they come back to it, you know, they, they pan to somebody else, they or they just cut from one scene to the next scene, a little bit of action. They're not random cuts. The fighters are in similar positions. They're in a similar location on the mats. The fighters are working their way towards a big white line on the edge of the mat. You see Kimura helping heal you up from that place. I feel confident in saying, as I've evaluated this video, that the highlight reel of the fight is not a highlight reel. We're simply watching one throw by Kimura, then the groundwork leading up to the submission. The opening scene of the fight might be from round one, because they both look very fresh, and Helio doesn't look like he had just been ragdolled yet. So that might be from round one. All the other groundwork, all the other fight sequences appear to be in order in round two. Just cutting out a little bit of the parts without action. Does the full fight footage exist? Maybe. It could be lost legitimately or we could be left with a bare minimum needed to tell the story. If I was running a martial arts school, I wouldn't want this footage coming out of me eating ragdoll circulating in public. That's horrible for business. The fact is, this footage doesn't even show the submission. doesn't show it. We're missing a lot here, guys. But we know how it unfolded. Kimura's story doesn't end with this fight. Of course, neither one of the stories end with this fight. But it does take a heartbreaking turn. And we do have film of this. So, let's go back to Japan, 1951, after the fight. Uh, Kimura established a international pro wrestling association, and he performed in uh, wrestling matches for several years. Uh, you, you know, making money—that's what—that's what he was doing. There's also a guy, Ricky Dozen, who started a professional uh, wrestling federation. He called it the Japanese Professional Wrestling Alliance. Now, Kimura and and Ricky Dozen were both famous, but Ricky Dozen was a star and he was considered the father of Japanese pro wrestling and it was a big sport uh, so he also so Ricky Dozen had a uh, background in karate and sumo wrestling a big guy and so there was a money making opportunity for both of them to kind of combine their forces and you know why don't we do a tag team match with two American guys two big American guys so the Sharp Brothers Ben and Iron Mike they were both six foot five, and they were said to be the tag team world champions. This was back when people thought this was real. <laughs> I remember thinking it was real as a kid. Uh, this is before my time, but I watching you know the old uh, professional wrestling. I'm like, this is the real deal. And back then, people thought this Japanese pro wrestling stuff was real, and pro wrestling matches were a super big deal. Uh, TV started to get more popular. Uh, at first, people would watch these pro wrestling matches standing in the streets, looking into shop windows and huddled around and, and, and create a buzz. And people would begin to just buy their own TVs and, and, and be able to watch them at home. And, and Ricky Dozen would, became one of Japan's first true TV stars. Very popular guy. And so the match with Ricky Dozen and Kimura teamed up against the Sharp Brothers, you know, after World War II, and it was still hungry for victories over America. These two big American guys, this is a lot of money coming in. Here's the script. The Sharp Brothers would fight dirty. 
they would cheat and they would trick the referee and distract him and they would fight dirty and it would be a long, tough fight. But eventually, Ricky Dozan and Kimura would find a way to win. And that's what happened. And they everybody made money. Sharp Brothers made money. Kimura made money. Ricky Dozan made money. It was a good deal. So after that, there's another big match to be to be made. And if you haven't thought of this right now, Ricky Dozan versus Kimura. That's a huge moneymaker uh, for pro wrestling. They had already agreed. We're going to do three matches. And it's going to be billed as the duel of the century. Now, people didn't know it was going to be three matches because it was real. But um, that's what they decided. Duel of the century. So here's the plan. Kimura and Ricky Dozan, they talked. They agreed that, that uh, this would be a very lucrative venture they, they would go on here. They decided... That, yes, three matches. They decided that it would be an hour, the first match, and it would be a draw. Which sounds like it would be a bit boring, but really, uh, they're going to bring in the action the whole hour. The outcome of the second match would be decided by chance. And they would do paper, scissors, and stone to determine who would win. After the second match, they would do the paper, scissors, stone again to determine the winner of that. So, uh, they kind of had a game plan. They really didn't know who was going to be the the total winner of the whole thing, but they did have a way to get three fights out of this, make money each time, build a fight each time. This is a great idea. They even got together. They rehearsed the moves. Uh, Ricky Dozen uh, practiced some karate chops on Kimura. Here's how I'm going to do it, and here's how you take the, the shot. Kimura did some throws on Ricky Dozen to you know, pick him up. He's a much bigger guy, uh, and, and just kind of work this safely, but you want to throw in that drama as well. So this match is on YouTube, and it is troubling to watch. Now, the length of the match, you can't determine that by the the video. There are some cutaways. You don't really know how long uh, this actually lasted. I'm going to bring you right there. You can go watch it as well, but we're going to run through this video. The film is black and white, so both men enter the ring one at a time. They're each wearing robes. And a slim but fit referee wearing a white shirt and white pants will be the third man in the ring. Ricky Dozan looks to be a head taller than Kimura and a significant heavier build. Both men are fit but not quite trim. Kimura wears brief style wrestling shorts and is barefoot. Ricky Dozan has pants and shoes. The men tie up several times. It's clear this looks like fake wrestling to me. Having been entertained by this Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior as a kid, this is this is what they're doing here. They're tying up, they're breaking, they're bringing some action. Sometimes I'm going to call Ricky Dozan Ricky for short, or Rick, because I get excited uh, talking about this, and Ricky Dozan's a long name. And uh, so anyway, Ricky is even making an effort to run his hand through his hair and maintain his hairstyle. After a few tie-ups, Kimura does a throw. After the throw, Kimura takes a few steps back, letting Ricky up. Some grappling happens. Uh, You see there's a head scissors involved applied to Kimura. Kimura struggles and really works his way free. Uh, The men continue to have a short but awkward grappling exchanges that don't look real to me. Uh, They always end up with the men standing and squaring off again. Just trying to figure out this puzzle in front of me. I got a big fight here, you know. Uh, Ricky picks up Kimura, turns him upside down, and slams him on his back. It looks super dramatic, but in reality, it's, it's pretty well safe. So Ricky gets north-south position from this slam and uh, goes for the pin. Kimura turtles up to his knees there. It's just a size difference. So if, you're, if some of these positions are a little bit foreign to you i apologize uh so kimura is on his hands and knees and then ricky dozan is kind of on his hands and knees too but on top of kimura with their heads pointing in opposite directions ricky dozan wraps his arms around kimura's belly and picks him up and then he puts him on his shoulder so in reality kimura's back is laying across his shoulder and he's carrying him like he would carry uh like a like a big log or something heavy that's kind of long as well like, this is scary. I don't, I'm looking at this like, how's he going to get Kimura down without really messing him up? Because Kimura is kind of flopping around, looks out of place. I, I'm trying to figure out how he's going to let him down without hurting the guy. Ricky Dozan walks to the edge of the, the ring. Kimura hooks his arm around a rope, 
and Ricky lets him down, and it's super safe. Like, I can do that. Like, I don't, I don't have any experience in this, but, like, that looks like it's so simple and so safe. Like, Ricky Dozan could not have put him down in a more safe manner after picking him up in such a crazy way. Then they reset in the middle. There's some more tie-ups, some more action. Ricky does some, like, winding up of a big karate chop, and, and Kimura takes a step back in a defensive step, and they just kind of, they're just playing it up. More grappling exchanges, more kind of just weird, not not real grappling. This is all pro wrestling. This is all two guys in this ring. They're going to do an hour. They're going to be rich by the end of this thing. It's going according to plan, and it's pretty exciting. I'm not a pro wrestling fan, but this they're doing a good job here. But after this, the pro wrestling's over. So the camera cuts away, and then it cuts back to both men squaring off. Ricky reaches for a tie-up, which they've done like a million times in this match, and Kimura throws a short kick to Ricky's waist. It's possibly to the groin, but to me it looks high. I think he missed. Ricky pauses, touches his waist where the kick land, and then it's like Ricky flips a switch and loses his mind on this. He punches Kimura with a right hand in the jaw. Kimura is backed into the corner. Ricky then lands several big open hand strikes to Kimura's head. This looks nothing like what we've seen earlier. This is totally different. This is a fight. Kimura under attack in the corner changes levels. So he, he, it's a wrestling thing. He changes levels and attempts a double leg takedown on Ricky. And Ricky partially defends this. Kimura like turns the corner to uh, progress in this wrestling technique. And he puts Ricky in the corner. So Kimura has kind of switched places with this, with his double leg. Uh, and then the referee breaks him up. And Kimura loses this control of, of Ricky's waist. The referee looks at Kimura and points at his shoe, signifying that the kick was not allowed. The kick that set off this barrage of punches is somehow the problem here. So as the referee's talking to Kimura about this, this illegal kick that he did to Ricky's waist... Ricky charges back into Kimura with the left hand, and the referee is now going to be done with the warning. Ricky lands several more punches. Ricky kicks Kimura in the stomach. Kimura looks at the referee. The referee stands back and points at his own foot again. Kimura is no doubt confused. He's under attack physically. Another kick lands to Kimura's stomach. Kimura drops to one knee. Ricky Dozan kicks him again in the face with his shoe. Kimura now covers his face with his hands while on his knees. He's just trying to avoid more punishment. Ricky now winds up, so most of these kicks are fairly short. He winds up and kicks Kimura in the face. This is the biggest kick yet. Kimura back in that turtle position trying to minimize damage. Ricky will then drag him in this turtle position to the middle of the ring by just pulling on his armpits. He's like, you're too far to the edge. He just drags him to the middle of the ring, and this, this Kimura is all huddled up trying not to get destroyed here. So now, standing over Kimura, he stomps on the back of Kimura's head and neck. Kimura tries to grab a, a, a leg, and, and Ricky throws some punches. Uh, so Ricky does in, steps back. Kimura stands up, staggering. He's in the corner. The referee he gets in Kimura's face, and looks at him for a fraction of a second. The referee then backs out of this, and Kimura's looking at the referee like, what is going on here? And Ricky moves in for a few more strikes, and one of them ends up dropping Kimura to his stomach in the corner. Kimura lays on his stomach, and uh, the referee counts out. He starts counting one, two, for Kimura to get up. He starts to move his head, but the ten count happens. It's completed. And Ricky Dozan's hand is raised by the referee. People rush in the ring, Ricky Dozen celebrates. Kimura looks beaten and confused. The men meet amongst the crowd. Like the, you can picture the crowd after a fight, like a bunch of people in it, and everybody is cheering and excited and and uh, amped up. The the, the two men kind of end up meeting in the middle of the ring to shake hands. Uh, Ricky says a few words to Kimura. Who knows what he said? And a championship belt is tied around Ricky Dozan's waist. If you watch this fight, it's hard to watch. And why is it so violent? I, I ask myself this because I, I'm not a, I'm not a, like a big fan of MMA, but I'll watch MMA. It doesn't bother me one bit. It's so hard to watch because of many of the things that Ricky Dozan does. 
Or do you just get him flat out disqualified in MMA? It's so violent because Kimura didn't sign up for this. It's, it'd be the same thing as if they picked an unwilling fan out of the crowd at UFC and said, you're going to fight this guy. Like, well, granted, most of them aren't as skilled as Kimura, but like, he didn't sign up for this. He signed up for a pro wrestling match to make money, to support his family. Like, that's what he signed up for. And he ends up getting in there. I don't know why he threw this kick, but it appears that this kick set Ricky Dozan off. And then he just beat the crap out of him, <laughs> for lack of a better term. It's violent because it's it's one-sided. It's just a beating, and Kimura has no way out of it. In modern MMA, if you want to stop the fight, it's over, the, you know, pretty much that second, or, you know, hopefully don't take much more damage than that. Kimura doesn't want this. You could tell by looking at his face. He's more, he's just as confused as anything. The referee messed up his attempt at a takedown. The referee would separate him uh, to only yell at Kimura, and then the Ricky Dozan would come in with more punishment right behind that. It was just a weird situation. I don't think the referee was necessarily trying to do anything against Kimura, but he was also, I think, confused, and it worked out that it went terrible for Kimura, and the referee was part of that. After this fight, there were some threats made on Ricky Dozan's life. They weren't made by Kimura necessarily. Kimura was clean out of all this, but they were made by other members <laughs> that uh, were upset by this match. Nothing happened of these threats. And, of course, the, the two other matches, which would have made them much more money, uh, they didn't happen. Now, Kimura describes this fight a little bit differently. And he says that Ricky was blinded by a desire to make money and to be famous. It attacks him. It's hard to read these things. That didn't happen. Uh, Ricky Dozan was already famous. <laughs> uh, doing this cost him a lot of money because it ruined the other two matches. I don't know what the deal was. I don't know what this kick that Kimura threw. Um, I don't know what happened right before that, but I don't think anything because Ricky Dozan looks like he's he's doing the same thing. And then you could watch the video. You could tell by looking at his face that kick set him off, and he, he wasn't here to get kicked. And I don't think it racked him, but it definitely bothered him. And just he was so much bigger and stronger than Kimura, and he was also angry, <laughs> flew into that rage, and Kimura caught the brunt of it. He could have been seriously injured in that thing. But it was not documented that he was seriously injured. He was just beaten. And uh, he lived on to continue to do things. He ended up traveling again uh, to make money and, and to use his skills as a, as a judoka and as a professional wrestler. Uh, one notable fight was with Santana. So it was uh, billed as Santana versus Kimura. It was 1959 when uh, Kimura went back to Brazil for his last pro wrestling tour. And he was challenged by Valdemar Santana. Santana was a jiu-jitsu champion, and he was managed by Carlson Gracie. He was 27 years old, 6 feet tall, 205 pounds, and estimates on the weight is that that's 40 pounds more than Kimura was, and that he had knocked out Helio Gracie in a fight that lasted more than three hours. So that's kind of a background on who Santana was. And Kimura walked in there and accepted a two-fight deal with him. The first fight would be a submission fight, and the second one would be under Valetudo rules 10 days later. The first match didn't really attract much attention. Santana had mostly a defensive strategy, but newspapers described Kimura winning at will, cat and mouse style yet again. The second match, uh, Kimura claims to be nursing a knee injury. Uh, he didn't want to fight the second fight. It was going to be different. It was going to be there was going to be striking involved, and Kimura was not much of a striker. He wanted out of this fight, whether it was the knee injury or the fact that it was so few rules and striking was allowed. But the fans were already in the stands, and the police started talking to Kimura, and they told him the stories like, hey, there was a boxer that refused to fight, and he was shot and killed. <laughs> and that uh, the fans might burn down the stadium, and he would be liable for that as the person who caused this by not fighting. And uh, so Kimura's like, you know what? I'm going to fight. <laughs> so he, he's walking into the ring, and he's and he, somebody's waving at him, you know, a friendly wave. And it's Helio from the uh, radio booth. As he's a commentator for this fight. That's kind of fun. And so this fight, it's not Kimura's best or biggest by any stretch, but, uh, you know, Santana lands some strikes and some opening and strikes, some kicks. Kimura gets a takedown. They stand back up. Uh, Kimura ended up doing a takedown, but he slips on the mats and ends up on the bottom. And they, they both just kind of beat on each other for a little while. It appears to be a 
fairly action-filled fight for four 10-minute rounds. Now, it also appears this fight is fairly even. But reading Kimura's account, this was a horrible experience. He hated every, every minute of it. He thought he was risking his life. He was worried that he could actually die during this fight. Um, reading any reports from the media, it was a fairly close fight. It was a tough fight, 40 minutes long. They just kind of beat each other up. But uh, it does appear. And maybe, yet again, probably Kimura was trying to sell how bad this fight was and how crazy it was. And like he claims he broke Helio's arm and he claims that, that Ricky Dozan just attacked him out of a rage to make money and be famous. He was already very famous and that attack cost him a lot of money. Regardless, it was a very tough fight and Kimura didn't have positive feelings about this fight in Brazil. So it kind of wraps up his traveling around and making money, uh, at least all the, uh, the, the major things. So let me just run a quick timetable for you here with the recent events. Uh, Kimura had that crazy match that went bad with Ricky Dozan in 1954. In 1959, he goes back and fights Valdemir Santana in Brazil, and he's traveling around making money again. And so after that, in, uh, on December 8th, 1963, Ricky Dozan is attacked with a urine-soaked short sword, and he died on December 20th. A lot of people suspect that Kimura was somehow behind this attack, but this was unable to be proved, and it really looks like that kind of falls apart. It, it likely was just a bad situation. Uh, Ricky Dozan upset the wrong person, and he stabbed him with a urine-soaked short sword. Who doesn't have that handy? But Kimura never forgave Ricky Dozan for his actions that unfolded in the ring and the, the just beating that he took. He never forgave him for that, and maybe he would have if if Ricky Dozan would have lived long enough. But in the time frame that they had together on this earth, Kimura just couldn't let that go. It was just too devastating for him. Let's go way back to Kimura's competitive judo career. He was awarded a flag. He refused to give that back to the the governing body for judo, and they were upset with him on that. And when he was in Brazil the first time and traveling around, he gave several belt promotions. So he took somebody from the next, from one level to the next. He says, you're at this level, I'll promote you. And the governing body was upset about that. They froze him at the seventh Dan uh, level for 40 years. I think this was a big deal. Uh, I think we talk a lot in jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, that the belt really isn't that big of a deal. The rank, you know, like... You just want to get better and you want to train and, and whatever belt level you are, just try to get a little bit better today and try to be healthy. But your belt level and your rank for Kimura, I think, was an important thing. He accomplished a ton in judo and, and other things as well. But being frozen at seventh Dan for 40 years, I think, bothered him. And it was a setback. And and these setbacks in wrestling and this, these hard times he found really during life and this tough fight with Valdemar Santana um, – he never really wavered in having a good, positive spirit. He continued to teach judo and, and kind of went into a slower-paced lifestyle as he got older. He would he taught at his uh, university where he went to school. Uh, he did that from 1960 to 1993. That's when he died. Um, he, he taught Olympic athletes, some of them achieving bronze and silver medals. And, and one of his students got an All-Japan Championship. Uh, so he, he made a successful transition to coaching. Uh, like I said, he died in 1993. It was April 18th. He had a long battle with lung cancer. He died at age 75. So that wraps up Kimura's life. We started with him as a kid. We brought him through as, as he learned judo and, and then he, as he traveled and, and made money and did all these crazy fights and uh, back home, you know, an instructor or a coach training athletes, and he died of lung cancer. And I look at all this, and and one thing is kind of crying for attention is like, how good was he on the ground? He was very good on the ground, and a lot of judoka are very good on the ground. So I started to examine early UFC, UFC 1, UFC 2, you know, like, what was going on there? And it's interesting from the lack of judoka that were involved in the early UFCs. UFC, uh, for those of you who don't know, was created by Horion Gracie. 
And it was it was what it was. It was a real deal of fights, you know. But um, it was also used as a tool to promote the, the Gracie brand. And they they would have these local garage fights and challenges in California. And they just wanted to take it to the next level. They wanted to televise it. They wanted to make it national. They thought they would do well against all these other arts. And they were right. It was a, a great tool to promote Gracie Jiu-Jitsu and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. UFC number one was November 12, 1993. So just a little while after Kimura, Kimura died in April and UFC came around in on November of the same year. So I went back and I looked and, and I was like, wonder what martial arts, wonder if judo was invited to be in UFC one. So UFC 1 had Savit, had sumo, kickboxing, American Kempo, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, of course, kickboxing, shoot fighting, and Taekwondo. Judo was missing. And it wasn't like Judo wasn't a big sport. It had been in the Olympics since 1972. It's a worldwide sport. But they weren't invited to UFC 1. Now, okay, maybe it was just a fluke. Uh, what other martial arts can we find for UFC 2? UFC 2 had ninjutsu, karate, taekwondo, another karate athlete, uh, wing chung, sambo, san su, muay thai, kickboxing, uh, jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, pinka slant, I'm probably saying it wrong, and shaolin kwa. Some of these martial arts I'm not familiar with at all, uh, but I'm just I'm mostly a student of jiu-jitsu. I'm not really interested in a lot of other arts. But yet again, this Olympic sport that is, judo was not invited to the UFC 2. And I don't know if that's if I'm just reading too deep into this or if they, they thought they would be a potential threat to what they were wanting to do on the mats and what they were wanting to do in the octagon. It was UFC 3 that had the first judoka, and it was a judo player from the United States. His name was Christoph Leninger, and he they got matched up with Ken Shamrock, and Ken Shamrock beat him. That was was the first judoka to enter the UFC. I just thought that was a interesting fact as I kind of looked into that and I was wondering, you know, maybe they just didn't find a, a, a judoka that they wanted to put in the UFC. Maybe they respected the high-ranking ones that they would be uh, potential, you know, losses and they, they wanted to, to fight more of a striker and less of a of a grappler that had a gi on that knew how to use the gi, uh, you know, but they, I mean, I'm not downplaying what happened in UFC one or two, but judo was missing. And I think it, any, any judo players in the night, in the early nineties, if they would have been offered that spot, if they would have taken it, it would have been inter- interesting. I don't know. Maybe there were offers. Maybe no one wanted to do it. It's kind of hard to read into that, but it's just interesting that they were not present for that event. We go through all this story of Kimura. I know that a lot of people think that they know, you know, what happened in the Kimura Helio or who Kimura was. They have a little knowledge of it. But when I talk to people, a lot of people are just their facts are just kind of wrong. And so I hope that uh, that this has helped you gain a little bit of more understanding with Jujitsu's history and uh, and and what what's happened there. I've got tons of uh, sources i'll put links to them in the show notes you can go if you want to read more or learn more it's really fun to dig into this i have read a lot of books and articles and i definitely want to highlight some of those as my sources i'll put links to them in the show notes if you're interested in digging deeper by all means uh, go get these books and read these articles and check out the websites but uh roberto Pereira uh wrote uh books called Choke, C-H-O-Q-U-E. And he also has a website called Global Training Report Archives. Um, great resources for jiu-jitsu history. I was reading volume two of Choke, and it's the untold story of jiu-jitsu in Brazil from 1950 to 1960. And it's just kind of uh, a great documentation uh, of of what happened, who was fighting who, and, and it gets into these these names that nobody that would be forever lost in history if he didn't document them there. So that's really cool. And it's also fun to have that book and then go, you know, if you're reading it in public space, what book are you reading? And then you have to explain to them, it's not just a, just a history book. It's just a history book from 1950, to 1960. It's just a history book from 1950, to 1960 that took place in, in Brazil. <laughs> like it's, that's pretty specific. Um, anyway, uh, there's another book called Kimura, The Triumphs and Tragedy of One of Japan's Greatest and Most Controversial Judo Champions, and that's by Christopher M. Clark. 
Uh, I got some information from Kimura himself. He wrote My Judo, and there's part one and part two to that. And I've I've found stuff like sourcing information about the stadium and and demographic stuff from Wikipedia and Reddit. There's lots of good information there as well, obviously. And I'd just like to uh, to thank you guys for uh, taking a look into Masahiko Kimura with me. It was it was fun to look back at the past and to see somebody help shape what, something that I enjoy so much today, and that's jujitsu. Kimura and obviously Elio Grace. Nobody denies Elio Gracie's uh, stamp on. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is huge, but just to look at Kimura's place in the history of our of our martial art here, um, you, you know what? Your martial art has a history as well, and it may not be uh, with great fame and fortune and, and the way you make a living and, and be stamped in the history books alongside other uh, greats, and you may never get a move named after you, but that doesn't mean that your story is not happening. And that the characters in your story are not important because they are. So my advice to you guys is carry yourself like your story will someday be told long after you're dead. And take time to help others along the way. It pays off and and it really just helps everybody. Just think of yourself as being part of jujitsu history. And your echoes may not be as loud, but they're definitely there. And if you're new to all this... Uh, martial arts and you just have enjoyed the story of Kimura. I do jujitsu. I don't do judo. But if you don't train, I definitely encourage you to walk into your local gym and give it a try. The stuff we've read about and, and talked about, modern martial arts are not run like that anymore. We're not going around uh, getting in fights and trying to compete with each other and, and seeing who's the toughest out there. Modern martial arts gyms are run like a business. They want to earn your business. They want to create a safe and fun environment to teach you these skills. <laughs> the skills are legitimate. They teach you how to how to defend yourself. They teach you how to fight. They teach you how to how to fight against other skilled people. It's it's really a, an amazing thing. So I'd say if you're nervous about walking into a gym, you will not walk into a jujitsu school and find yourself in a fight club. You can just go and and watch and sit back and and, and watch the class. And if they don't treat you well take your business to a different school. So if you're at all curious about doing uh, any martial art, judo, jiu-jitsu, any of them, just remember you're a customer. They need to earn your business. And if you go in with that thought process, you're going to be treated well and there's nothing to be scared of. I want to thank you guys again for listening to this and hopefully enjoying this. This project has taken a lot of time and effort and energy and uh, it changes the way this podcast runs all together. If you next time you hear guys hear somebody talking about Kimura, whether it's the person or the submission, ask them if they know about that person. Ask them if they know the history. Ask them if they know about the stacking dozen facts. Uh, you know, share a little bit of this knowledge with them and get them interested in it. We'll see you on the mats, guys, and stay sweaty, my friends. <laughs>